Finance Committee, and I'll call the meeting of Thursday, January 26th, the order at 7.03 p.m. I have with me from the Finance Committee, um, Tom Parkins, Dean Nahadis, um, Maury Creighton, Andy Olderman, and myself, Sarah Mellish. Um, from the school department, I have Pam and Avi Irvis. Um, and I have Ann, Anna Mitchell from the school committee and Ann Harrison from the select board. Our agenda tonight is to discuss the Manchester Essex Regional School District budget, which is a budget in process, um, which gives us an opportunity to provide them with input before they finalize the budget on February 6th. It's a long Zoom or not? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, and so, um, for members of the board, um, Greg and I received the most recent thing from the school department this morning. I didn't realize not everyone received it, so I believe Greg just emailed it to you. Oh, no, he's getting there. <laughs> oh, he's getting there. Um, were any of you able to, I was kind of in the zone the other on Tuesday night, so I don't know how many people were able to tune in to that discussion. Okay. Yeah. Affordable housing just meeting. Okay. meeting every we night all do have some meetings, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> every night this week. It's bad week. <laughs> so, I guess if, if you could start with sure. just giving us an overview of um, where you stand, where the hot buttons are, <laughs> and then I'll bring out the hot button I saw. <laughs> Counting on it. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction to it. Um, I think our mantra around the school district is uh, we make our decisions with students at the center. So before we dig deep into the spreadsheets and into the accounting of the budget, I just like to remind people that what we're putting forth is um, a budget that we think puts the district in good position to continue to provide uh, the program breadth and scope that we do now. Um, and achieve the same level of quality. You'll see that we've labeled the budget a level services budget, so me meaning we're really looking for um, an adjustment to the budget this year at the outset that just addresses um, our key drive, the increase in our key drivers. We're not looking to add anything directly to the budget. We're not adding a new program. We're not bringing on um, any new uh, technologies, uh, the fields we'll talk about separately. The operating budget is just a consistent uh, budget that tries to address uh, the, the costs of uh, health, personnel, special education and mandated costs, and adjust forward without doing any damage to our program. Uh, that being said, where we're at in the budget now, and the way we, we work it is typically I'll give the big picture and Avi can take you through any of the specifics of the numbers is Again, we started out the season pursuing a level services budget. I think in your mini packet there, you have the scenarios that we discussed the other night. So while we're looking to maintain program scope and quality um, and pursue our strategic initiatives and believe we can do so within a level services budget, I think you know that over the past few years, we have been making cuts to the budget and utilizing reserves to hit our target, which we believe we've all agreed upon to kind of keep assessment um, in and around three and a half percent. Some of the cuts, many of the cuts we've been able to make were enrollment based. So enrollment has been um, declining primarily through a demographic shift. That's allowed us to take some, what we've been calling attrition. So reduction of heads without having to lay anyone off. So if someone retires, we simply don't, re don't replace them. Uh, we may move someone around in the district to cover that program, but we've been able to take enrollment reduction based um, head cuts through attrition without doing any damage to the program. Last year, I'm sure you remember the conversation that we did start to get to the level where we were um, we were talking about and ended up in the end making some reductions in elementary and middle school Spanish. Um, that was our, our really our first um, cut that impacted program, so you'll see we have an ongoing discussion under the scenarios to look at a potential reinstatement of that, along with some other items which I'm happy to explain if you have questions about them. I think, you know, don't 
don't look at that reinstate and stabilize column, the green column, which is currently under discussion. That isn't our ending point. It's our current discussion point. Um, based on past year's budget, my guess is we end up somewhere in between the hybrid, so to speak, of the level services and the stabilized budget or all the way back to level services. We started to, the other night, get into some of these things. We're going to come back next meeting with a little more detail on them and talk about them in depth. Um, they're essentially a few reinstatements, and I think we're looking for a discussion around stabilization, not necessarily a direct add back, and I think that will be informed um, by the direction we go uh, with the fields. Through collaboration, we've been talking about um, <coughs> how best to address the fields in light of the fact that the SS elementary timeline seems to be accelerating a bit. Um, we know we did. We had a facilities report completed. It's the preliminary report was released and reported out um, in early November. It's essentially noted that I think what we knew at Six Elementary is past its useful life. Um, there looks to be the need for short-term investments to to maintain the building. Um, with I think it's a signal that we need to start our application process to the MSBA, and we're looking to do that um, as early as April. Last time we went in really quick, more traditionally, it takes schools a few tries to get into the pipeline, so I think that's a wait and watch. But in light of the discussion that that may be a more near-term issue for us to deal with, there was discussion and debate, and I have to say I was, I, I don't think I was there in the beginning, but I understand the reasoning um, after the ongoing discussion to talk about whether or not instead of depleting our reserve funds by 50%, whether we should discuss the option of, we've used two phrases, either a capital or a debt exclusion to fund the fields with the intent of explaining to the community that that would allow us to preserve the reserves and allow for um, a better positioning if we needed to go out to borrow um, sooner rather than later. So the interplay between stabilization um, and, re and the uh, strategy around the field replacement, I think would be dependent on which direction we go. So when we add sta added stabilization as, as a discussion point on, under the reinstate and stabilized budget, we were thinking we would be going into next year um, with 50% less reserves as they would go to address the fields. Um, so again, there are some uh, related costs in here. We would, I don't think we'd be looking at a scenario where we're going out for some type of an exclusion and adding a direct line for stabilization. It, probably, it will be likely either or, which will lower that number. So this is kind of the gist of the discussion we are trying to work through at the school committee. Uh, it was a hearing the other night, so there's a lot of questions and we went in a lot of different directions. I think this will be the, the bulk of our conversation going into um, Tuesday the 7th. That's a snapshot of where we are. Avi, do you want to go over some of the the budget overview kind of key sure. key financial drivers for this year? Yeah, I'm just looking at the, okay, the pages here. So this is the one that's labeled 24 on the bottom. Uh, you have a we, we, we have a draft 110-23. <coughs> it's just a budget overview. Yep, that's the one. Thank you. Yeah, the first yeah. pages are just the very high level. Got it. Got it. So this is just a quick overview of how big the budget is. It's $30.1 uh, million, dollars, which is a spending increase of 4.2%. That type of a spending increase uh, is a little higher, but not much higher than the typical range that we've seen over the past couple of years. If you've looked at our budget presentations, you see that the spending range tends to be in the high twos to mid threes typically, sometimes such as a four depending on the given year. Uh, and you can see that primarily there's more in operating expenses at this time with that number, which is about a third of our budget growing 6.6%, whereas personnel is growing 2.8%. Uh, Pam talked about how we have, because of enrollment and right sizing, uh, four full-time equivalent FTE reductions. That's bringing us down to the 2.8% number. That's partly why you see that number being a little lower than our typical run rate. Um, and so when you take out non-town revenues to fund that spending, we get a little bit of state aid, not very much. Typically, non-town revenues 
in the 10 to 15 percent of, of our funding. Um, what's left is the operating assessment tip accounts. And so that this year is a 6.53 percent. It's a very unusual year, as you know. Um, typically, that number ranges in the mid twos to the low to mid threes. Um, of course, then it gets a portion between the two towns for the past several years. Of, a higher percentage has been going to Essex in terms of growth into Manchester. So Manchester's numbers have been below that median line. Um, so, um, in the reason it's at 6.53% this year is because we have removed one of the non town revenue lines from the budget, which is the use of reserves as a revenue source to fund operating. You know, that's something, you know, if you've taken a 10 year to 15 year look at our budget, um, tends to not be in there initially. Over time, it starts to creep up as a use to help keep assessments to the towns at a level that's affordable within the levy limit. Because you know the goal has been, as one of the budget goals, to not trip a levy limit override uh, on a regular basis and to have that happen as rarely as possible. Knowing, though, that most um, school systems, their natural rate of growth will be above that 2.5 level. And so if we can manage it for however many years, the last time it was a 10 year period since we had asked for a correction, now we're approaching the eighth year. So it's several years of trying to manage that growth and keeping the town assessments within the levy limit. Eventually a correction needs to happen because we're gonna be funding that differential between your spending growth, which is a little above um, that, that levy limit number uh, and the town assessment. So we've, in, in the fiscal 23 budget, there's $520,000 as a revenue line from reserve funding. The year before was 335 for two, and the year before that. So we're trying to, you know, we've been talking to the communities for about two or three years now about the fact that soon it will be time for a correction, trying to plan ahead. We do a lot of multi-year forecasting uh, and planning and scenario analysis so that we're not springing anything up on anybody suddenly but rather having time to plan for when that correction would be. So as I mentioned, this would be the eighth year since a correction's happened. So it's our, our hope that this is not new news, but something that we've been able to plan for ahead of time. Um, the deficit, if we didn't have that correction, to get back to a 3.5% kind of agreed upon target is $757,000. So that's how much we would have to cut if we didn't get that correction this year. Um, the other numbers I think that are worth just talking about are reserves. How, how much are they? What do they look like? Um, and we sent around information about the historical levels. You know, like the towns, we tried to shoot for a benchmark of around 10%. Um, in the uh, past couple of years, it's been a little bit higher, but as we're starting to commit them as a revenue source, we're in danger of bringing them down. We also have some short-term reserves that have been happening uh, in our stabilization account. Uh, stabilization is a funding source of reserves that can be used for facilities projects. We took um, money that we gained on interest income and we borrowed money for the Memorial School. We borrowed up front and we had an unusual amount of interest income um, and uh, we agreed with our member towns to commit that to stabilization to fund capital projects. So, Capital income stayed with capital projects, and we have been using that on things primarily equalizing our program at Essex Elementary because they have a school that's about as old as Memorial School was, so that includes a playground replacement, technology um, upgrades, uh, security upgrades, things to make sure that that building is as close as we can get an old building to be from a program student-facing basis. Um, so that was about uh, just under a million dollars of interest income that we got from borrowing money uh, and waiting for those capital funds to be deployed on the construction project. Um, and it's all in a dedicated account for the facility enhancements. So um, that's going to be spent down um, by the end of 23. Most notably, as Pam mentioned, we've got the turf fields coming up. And as of now, uh, that would certainly take those funds down and require use of other reserves as well. So you can see the other sources, E&D, the excess and deficiency account, that's what regional school districts have for essentially end of year savings that can accrue over time. Um, the school choice uh, is a program that we have where we take um, students from other districts 
and we are reimbursed approximately five thousand dollars per head um, from the sending community through state aid funds that transfer over that reserve level has been fairly stable over time um, Bobby, do you have restrictions on how you can use the choice funds i'm just surprised it's so i'm surprised that it's in the, in the reserve fund, in the bnd balance it's not in the in the balance it's a separate fund okay and yeah, it's separate. There are no uh, restrictions. It can be used on anything that would be otherwise, that we can spend our budget on otherwise. Um, but we've tried to keep it stable, and I would say for the past uh, seven or years or so, what we've tried to do is just spend the annual income on annual operating expenses because that's you know a portion of our student body. Now, I want to say it's about 50 students um, are bringing in that income, and so we try to spend the money we get every year so we don't raise or lower that reserve fund. Um, so, Bobby, the, so the, a, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, the percentage reserves that you're reporting is that, uh, is that, uh, does that include stabilization? Or? So, are you on this one that looks like this slide 32? No, I'm actually on that reserve spreadsheet that got okay. If you go to the new, so that's where we're ending for 22. Um, if you go to the next one, it's, it gives you where we're at and what we're planning to spend. For yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can see we measure as a percentage of the operating budget. Our capital budget is really just net service. It's outside of the levy limit for taxpayer vote. So that's how we compare it to the operating budget because that's really what we're trying to see, what we might need needs for. Our capital budget doesn't take on anything other than net service. Yeah. It, it would be a lower percentage we added that in. And our stabilization fund for the town is kind of hard to get to. It has to be through town vote. How, how is your stabilization? You cannot put money into it without it going through town meeting. Yeah. But once it's in there, it can be appropriated by the school committee. Okay. On this, on the reserve snapshot, I'm just struggling with the numbers. Yeah, the so numbers. The school choice. You showed oh there's something wrong there. Yeah. yeah, that is I'm not sure what that is. Um, and the total doesn't add up either. Right. right. Okay. So I don't know if it's concerning. This got adjusted yesterday. Uh, and so let me pull up the actual numbers from my spreadsheet and I can tell you what the right numbers are. So 1264, 270, 1487, 389, it's the total number at the bottom. This is 3089, I think was the last number prior to the uh, fall off date. So that should say 3.4 million in yeah, the total. 3.41. Yep, that's right. So it's the numbers for the balances are all correct. Now, moving over to the uses. The, um, what, what this assumes is based off of 1.5 million, 1.494 is made up of 1.2 million of uh, turf replacement. That's 800,000 for one field and 800,000 times an assumed 50% rate for the second field because it's a shared use field with Manchester. So that's 1.2 million of the 1.494 in the total, which is correct. And when are you planning to do that? So we have two fields, Highland Field is at the high school, yeah. and Brook Street Field, which is the shared use field, just for people who may not be as familiar. The Highland Field is going to be done this summer one way or the other, just due to the condition. Uh, the Brook Street, we did put some interim improvements in last year that could tide it over uh, to two or three more years if necessary. We put out a bid uh, with bid results for both fields. Uh, that bid is due um, on February 2nd. Um, so we should be getting those results at the next school committee meeting. We'll be talking about them and the way we structured the big conditions. Uh, we have the option to um, postpone and deduct the Brook Street field just for a few years if necessary. Only in the reason that came up in discussion was if we get to a scenario where a revenue correction, such as an override, does not pass for this year and we are really in a situation where we have a major deficit, it did not seem like we would want to replace, have two brand new fields while cutting $757,000 out of our program. 
either way the Highland Street field is going to go because it's time. We have the money for both in the reserve fund, so it's not a question of that. It's just a question of making sure if we get into a, I would say, a difficult pinch from a lack of a correction that we can prioritize um, our use of funds to make sure we can manage the cuts that have to happen. Greg, is that the 400000 we have in our fiscal year 24? Yes, okay. for the half of the fee. Yep. So we, the bid specs indicate that we, it's a deduct alternate for Brook Street. We could deduct it. We assume that we'll get better pricing for doing both. And we also um, have alerted the bidders that we wouldn't make a decision on Brook Street until after the potential election dates in both communities. Now there is some discussion, as Pam mentioned, about whether we would shift from using reserves to pay for um, those, which is what we committed to community that we would do. We've got the funds identified to potentially doing uh, some type of uh, excluded payment, either through a capital exclusion, one-time payment, or through a debt exclusion where you borrow and probably over a short-term period, maybe five years or something like that. Um, and the logic there is if you look at our debt service capital budget, those numbers are coming down in most years, the way we structured the debt. So um, we're essentially returning, lowering the cost to taxpayers of that debt service every year. So you could essentially oh, you know, not reduce it, at, let's just say, keep things even for taxpayers. And instead of just rolling off Memorial, middle school, high school debt, you're actually rolling that off, adding a payment for the turf fields, and still taxpayers would probably have a small savings anyhow uh, because of if you amortize the turf field project or both of them over five years, you'd still, even with debt, um, have a net return to taxpayers in the capital budget. So that's just one way to go. It's a strategy. It does address the fact that um, when we're done with the project, we're not dealing with you know, 1.2 less in reserves out of the... Uh, out of the $4.1 million, it'd be a, a pretty big hit. And um, we know that we're going to be going for uh, you know, another bond rating update when we go out to borrow next um, for either final bonds on the Memorial School project. We do have one last bonding we need to do at some point. It'll be a small bond because we're mostly bonded already. Or if we ever need to go out um, in the next you know, three to five years, however many for Essex Elementary, to not have that $1. Million, uh, $2 million from the turf fields could definitely be something that the uh, bond rating agencies look at. That's what we've been told by our financial advisors. Hilltop, which I think may be the, the organization that um, the Town of Manchester uses. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be question. Um, what do you think the remaining bonding is going to be <clears throat> to finish up Memorial? I figure we are done with that, but yeah, what's um, the level, the dollar level roughly? I <clears throat> Could be right now. Our uh, the, we have short-term debt to float the last little piece, and it's at 1.3 million dollars. So I think it would probably be that, or it would be that or less. I think less. Um, that's kind of the maximum we would need to borrow. So we're floating 1.3 million dollars on a short-term basis. Everything else is bonded. And in terms of how long, <coughs> unfortunately, I think it could be easily another. Um, our capital budget assumes we're going to roll it in the next couple of weeks have payment due a year from now, I think there's a good chance it might go even another cycle. The only reason I say that is we've heard from our project management firm that MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, is very slow on its final closeout. And until they close out, you're typically not uh, allowed <coughs> to uh, bond a final payment. Um, you know, we get tax exempt status, obviously, for our bonds. and. Um, Bond council, you know, won't let you over borrow for something for which you might be receiving a state grant. We've got a contract, so with that with MSBA, that contract being open, it's it's got to be floated <coughs> you know, with the final numbers. Again, it's a very small number um, in terms of the total debt we we borrowed. I think the first one was, uh, I believe, thirty five million, followed by three point two three million. So that's about thirty eight million dollars. So on this last piece of one point three, I don't think it's a significant cost issue, but it is an item you want to close out and move on, especially if you've got a new project coming potentially with Essex Elementary. Hey, hey Sarah, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, go ahead, Mike. So, Bobby, you mentioned, you know, um, issuing bonds in the near future and you're working with this external advisor and, you know, bond ratings based on how much cash you have in reserves, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, can you quote a long request where they do kind of a I guess I'd call it a scenario analysis 
meaning you know, if you have x dollars or x percent in reserves, that results in a rating of this, which means you're borrowing that rate versus, you know, just so we can kind of, you know, look at different scenarios. You know, sometimes it might be worth it, right, to have the extra cash to get the better bond rating and the better interest rate, but maybe not, right? Maybe you're only saving 10 basis points, in which case it's not worth to have, you know, 15% cash versus 12%, you know, whatever. Just, it'd be nice to look at a scenario analysis. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Mike. And, um, you know, in the past, when we get to bonding strategy, we have tended to bring in the town partners to kind of create a little working group. We bring in Hilltop, and we do run scenarios like that. For Memorial School, we did a lot on, should we borrow up front? Should we borrow over time? Should we do level principles? Should we do level um, level payment? Uh, and, and I think you're right. That's something we would want to look at just to make sure that what we're thinking makes sense. The common initially came from them because I just said to them, I just want, you know, we're about to roll these bands. And I said, I just want you to be aware of the fact that A, we're going for a revenue correction this year. And B, you know, we have $1.2 million of you know, capital projects on the turf alone, 1.5 if you look at the other items that I mentioned, which are security updates, by the way, um, that the school committee has reviewed mostly at Essex Elementary. And uh, they said, yeah, well, they're going to be, a bond rating uh, agency will be glad to know that it's planned. Um, on the capital side, but they're going to want to know what your plan is to get back. But to your point, it might be quantifiable even if they say, yes, we're not happy about it. If it doesn't make sense financially and the net present value is better, you know, I'm, I, this, this is something that's going to be eventually funded through the capital budget, which is 100% funded by the taxpayers through the towns. Uh, there's no, you know, state aid to offset that. So I would be, you know, I, I think you're right. We need to go through that, and we need to have town representatives involved in that decision making. Yeah. I, I just look at it at a high level. You know, town of Manchester is obviously AAA rated. We're a good credit risk. You know, you flow from us to the town of Essex. Town of Essex, I think, is AA. You know, so I mean, we're all good credit ratings, right? Yep. I mean, yep. And you know, it's so it, yep. yeah. I'd be very interested to be part of the team that looked at that scenario analysis. Great. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think you're right. We have heard, Mike, that um, town ratings is just as important as our own financial situation. So I think everything you're saying is spot on. Right, because we, I mean, at the end of the day, we fund you guys, right? So I, I would almost think our credit rating is even more important. No offense. <laughs> it probably is. It probably is. Yeah. But yeah, it's just tell them about how money flows, right? That's right. We just... We have to take care of ours as well. So, yep, I look forward to that, and thank you for the suggestion. All right, thanks. So, I think those are the high-level, you know, overview. We kind of got into a little bit of the capital side, a little bit of the reserve side, and I'm sorry, some of these slides we were making some adjustments um, in real time before, so I apologize about that. But again, the number for the total, because this is important, is 3.4 million, and uh, we're looking at the. Total to be spent through summer is the 1.494. So um, I apologize for that error. Um, and that would um, that would take you to probably just above 5.3% as shown here. But I think you get the basic picture. I will get you out of corrected slide. Apologize. Is this being spent through summer 23 or summer 24? Well, it's going to be summer 23 if we do both fields. But if Brook Street slides that could turn into summer 24. So initially, we were talking about it being definitely through 23. I think, you know, we, we have to see how that plays out based on, I, I really think the operating budget will have a big impact. So our expenditure should be going out in FY23 or FY24? Like, when would the payment actually be? Uh, it would actually be, it, there, there could be some very small bills, mobilization in 23. The bulk of your payments are going to be in 24 for work that happens over the summer. Okay. And I would like to think that it will be done through the fiscal 24. Uh, but this here summer 24 reference on the header, we technically could push it into 25. But just remember, these are reserve funds. They're not through the operating budget. And so you're not dealing with necessarily a, a, a town meeting type of uh, fiscal year requirement. Uh, if we spend it that way, we're not spending it. Yeah, my only concern is the match that the town has to come up with. Mm -hmm. So we have oh. to get it into our budget. That's we correct. Don't have it in and that factored into some of the conversation that started at the meeting the other day, which is how we were approaching it, then some discussion about how we might rethink it. Um, I think we just we have a we have a lot of thoughts around and 
questions and strategy discussions around messaging it if we are doing a, an operational ask, combining it with a um, debt exclusion or capital exclusion. I think there's some ongoing discussion whether which is the appropriate method. Um, that that's two significant asks at the same time. So we do have a lot to discuss and think through. We're very interested in kind of what this group thinks because it's certainly nothing we can do on our own. Um, I know there's a lot of conversation around reserves in terms of borrowing in our credit rating. I kind of live in the practical, making sure you know we can do everything we have to in a given year. When I look at that Habib report too and see the liabilities list for Essex Elementary, one of my concerns as we draw down on reserves is just having enough on hand to handle emergencies that may inevitably come up there. And I think I recall this, we had gone out, we were starting to prepare for Memorial, and we had that water line. And like, mm -hmm. we thought, you know, $350,000 just overnight was gone from our reserves. So I think there's the potential for all of those things to start to happen to Essex. So I think that's another real consideration in terms of how, how healthy we keep our reserves and how much money we have on hand to manage. Yeah, the water line was a particularly interesting one. I don't know if anyone here was remembers when that happened, but one of the interesting things was it was below ground. It was not in our capital assessments because uh, it wasn't inside the building. It wasn't something you could readily see, and it was from the ex outside of the building to the road. And so we even had the question when it came up: Is this is this ours? Is it the town's? And uh, the town was we really wanted it to be the town. <laughs> we made sure it wasn't. <laughs> so and and, and, and so that's one of those things where you know it just had to happen. Um, and then we lost the boiler, and it was like, you know, are you kidding me? But we still we were occupying the building. The kids were there, so we had to we had to come up with resource. I can't recall the cost, but. I think, you know, the things I focus on in the day-to-day, -day, making sure we're up and running and kids can come to school and we're not canceling school because we don't have heat. It's, <coughs> it's important for us to have the resources to do that in the moment, should something happen. Yeah. And what was interesting about the boiler one was the building project for Memorial was underway. Uh, we had mm -hmm. already been to town meeting. We were already starting construction, and it literally could not make it that last season. So... Um, it was, you know, I think there was some insurance assistance that we got for that, which was kind of a miracle because typically insurance wouldn't pay for that. They'd say it's your own problem. I think maybe they were nice to us because we hadn't had a lot of claims. But, um, you know, those are the kinds of things when you look at Essex Elementary, even if we do go through the process of fast track where, you know, you could have some things that just go between now and when the building gets completed, whenever that is, if it's three, five, ten years, whatever the community decides, we just need to be aware of the fact that that is, you know, an increasing liability. Can I, can I, I think it's worth mentioning that the middle high school isn't a brand new building anymore either. And the report also covers what the projected cost will be for that building. So that's another um, a backstop for issues that may occur there. Yes. Sorry, I can come in. I was just going to say, I think there's always a trade-off here, and I mean, we talk about this with fire trucks and things. <laughs> you save, save thirty or forty or fifty. You, you spend thirty or forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, but you fend off spending a million mm -hmm. for a year or two. And you know, I think what we're talking about with you folks is, you know, thirty million. So anything we can do to kind of band-aid and move this along, and obviously you don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish, but you know. Money costs money, so mm -hmm. if we can delay or be reasonable, that's always worth thinking about. Sarah, can I ask a quick one? Yep, go ahead, Mike. So um, I think it was Maury that sent along today the, the reserve spreadsheet, like historical you know, dollars, percentages, which is very helpful, very, very informative, very good to look at. But my question is, would it be possible, I guess I'm asking this of Avi, to get uh, you know a handful of other school districts you know the same data right because to look at it in isolation it's kind of hard to determine right whether it's good or bad or high or low you know it'd be nice to kind of match it up against again a, a com comparable district whatever that would mean 
We have to. I, I forwarded along the spreadsheet you had sent yep. to me because everybody had asked yep. about that. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. So I mean, we, we can look at Triton, Pentucket, Hamilton, Wenham as our regional neighbors. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. It'd just be not, yeah. Because again, in isolation, it's hard to determine, right? Is it high, low? Is it right? I don't know. I guess we've been modeling at the 10% mark that both towns are at. So that's where we're, that's where we've been aiming our target. Uh, but yeah, I right. think it's, we can certainly look at those other communities. Those are the ones that come up in Moscow. Right. For, the other. for example, if those other school districts are at 5%, then we look high. If the other districts are at 20%, then we look low, right? I just, you know, right. You know, yep. I don't know. I think that's true, and I think that's where your other suggestion, Mike, of kind of figuring out with the rating agents, uh, sorry, with the, the financial advisors, what they recommend. I, I don't know if they're going to suggest that we do a comparable analysis as much as a financial analysis like the one you're proposing. But yeah, we can get that information, no problem. I, I, yeah, my, I mean, it, my, it, just, it can't hurt. Right? It just, yeah, no, no, hurt no. Data. My goal would be that we would be high performing in that area rather than average performing. Uh, it, primarily because our goal is to not send bills to you guys when something goes wrong and to also have some stability. And we've also seen that from an operating standpoint, we don't want to, we would never want to assume that if there is a revenue deficit that it would need to be addressed in one year's time. It takes time to explain what's happening. You want stability. And so when you look at our assessment numbers and our spending numbers, what we really tried to do is budget for stability. And at some point, that's when the reserves come in. So, um, uh, but yes, we can certainly get that data. Thank you. So, it, for, but where it is now, according to the spreadsheet, as of 2022, 10.7%, that's, so it seems Good. like it's on the mark. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, but and the issue is when you look at the slides of what we plan to spend in the coming years, that's where knowing that you've got $1.45 million uh, yeah. going out the door, it's really between that and the fact that we have 520000 as a revenue line that grows over time because the, the gap between stable spending for level services and you know, the 3.5% target um, can grow over time, over 7 to 10 years. So between the 520000 that we've got this year that would grow to 756000 in fiscal 24 plus the $1.2 million, that's why we're trying to look a couple of years out ahead. So I don't think we're coming to say we are, we, the crisis has already hit us, that we've already lost the money. We're saying, here's what our look forward model looks like. And I think the turf fields are, those are real items are going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, we kind of need to act before we hit that point. I, we, my suggestion, but it's really up to the community to decide what the right timing is. So Ed, let's go to the reserve snapshot. Yep. Um, in the, under the plan capital investments column, yeah. there's the 270K for facilities rental and stabilization at 389. How are those? So, so this is the one where the school choice number is supposed to be the delta between the 1.494, which is the correct number. That was what Anna was pointing out to us. That we're just I see. Up. Okay. So if you take those two, what is that, 679,000? Uh, that gets you 21, 321. Uh, just over, just around eight hundred thousand dollars would be the school choice number for what would need to be spent there to hit your one point four nine, of which one point two is the turf fields, and the remainder is the other capital uh, projects that we're going to be doing for security, as well as closing out the um, the meeting office. Okay, I guess I just wasn't understanding why those facilities rental and stabilization are under a planned capital investment column. That's what they're spending. They're using, a, they're using the dollars. Okay, you're drawing from that. Okay. Yeah, those will be the, so the first column is balance, the middle column is use. Oh, we, can make, okay. we can make them negative, might make it a little clearer. Mm -hmm. And then the second one would be ending balance. Okay. And I, again, it's, it certainly doesn't help that there's just a big zero there where there shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> what had happened was the second slide was we had done a last night for last night's presentation what this slide would look like if we had done a debt or capital exclusion. And so in those, we had zeroed out some of the reserve slides because we wouldn't be pulling down on the reserves. And somehow that slide accidentally turned into this one. So okay. my, my apologies. That's right. I'm usually with the, in these meetings over the years, I, like I'm trying to half listen to you and half look at what. Yeah. And so I end up 
getting nowhere. No, this is a good question. <laughs> Uh, be just a question for you on the spreadsheet that you sent around. It looked like the choice revenue was like one point six million. Does that sound right? But well, it had gone eight hundred. Is that a drop that's happened here? Eight hundred. I'm not sure where you're seeing it. Okay, that's of the that's of the one point six. That's a spend. Yeah. That's just Yep. Oh, other questions? Yeah. So if we could go to the scenarios. Yes. That's the <coughs> school committee. This is the scenario slide that Greg's talking about. This is what school committee began to discuss on Tuesday. So I think, I think it'd be worthwhile to spend some time mm -hmm. talking about this additional revenue. Yes. Yep. Cut, uh, mm -hmm. Row. <laughs> sure, I can give a quick overview, but yeah, do you have a question no, first? No, I think it would be good for you to give okay, an overview. Okay, sure. You can go from there. So I think if you start with the assumption that in the second column right now, with level services, we're talking about a $756,000 deficit between what we were proposing, which is the, the, the adjustment to stop using reserves as a revenue source and to increase the assessment to 6.53% for this year only, before we go back to more stable historical band. Uh, that's a $756,000 deficit between that 6.53% and the typical three and a half level that we've assessed at. Okay. Now, we could fix that, but as we know, there's growth that would happen in subsequent years. And the question is, how many years, and this isn't necessarily a question for us as much as it is for the community as well, because we're talking about revenue from the towns. How many years do you want this correction to last? And so um, our first revenue correction that we had was that I was here for was 2016, where we had uh, an override in the town of Manchester and the town of Essex used additional revenue and levy capacity to fund an increase. Um, and you know, at the time we said we were going to try and shoot for as close to 10 years as possible because it had been 10 years since the prior one, which is in 2006. Prior correction. So one of the questions that's come up now that we're looking at a number that is 756,000 for this year alone is, is eight to 10 years too long because you end up having a deficit that builds over time? And is it better to have smaller adjustments more frequently? Or is it better to have larger adjustments less frequently? That's the strategy question that's kind of being brought to the community to decide. And for us, what we try to control is our spending level and to understand what the revenue impact is. But when we start getting into taxation, that becomes more important for us to understand where the towns are at. Mm -hmm. So we started to discuss some scenarios with, with some of the, uh, the collaboration group and in public session as well about um, how that might look. So before you go on, can I ask a question yeah. about that gap? Yeah. Yep. Um, so in, in Manchester, our budget's tight, mm -hmm. and we have limited our non-union employees to a 2.5% increase. I noticed that you're using a 4% increase, and I'm wondering what portion of that 756000 is the difference between a 2.5% increase and a 4% increase. It's about fifty to 75000 when I calculate it. And the rationale behind the 4% is uh, if you look at the history of the contract employees' growth over the past five years, they have been growing on average between 35 and 3.8%. So their trajectory is outpacing every other employee group. So we have a growing uh, financial gap between them. Um, so the uh, discussion point this year was to put all non meta that meta is the contract group, in at the average rate that the teacher uh, salary would grow. I mean, I think to build that. Were you talking about I the non meta people when you asked that question about? Yeah, I think the problem is 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 you know under Prop two and a half we can only increase our taxes two and a half percent a year the levy capacity and therefore mm -hmm. we limit our non union employees to two and a half percent. It's hard for me to justify mm -hmm. voting for extra funds for the school. If you're paying your non-union employees four percent, and we can only pay our non-union employees two and a half percent, 
it just seems to be mm -hmm. uh, a dichotomy there. One of the concerns, mm -hmm. one of the issues that we're trying to address, not only is it in, uh, the lagging uh, wage growth between our two different employee groups, is we have supervisors being overtaken by teachers in terms of their salary. So you have people who have 12 month supervision responsibility of uh, faculty who are at or on the verge of making less money than the people that they supervise who work a shortage year. So we have to make some corrections to continue to hold employees and we're out in the market to bring in two more people to be competitive with our neighboring schools. It, on that point, it, it, it is worth repeating, which I think we've talked about prior years, all of the um, teachers' contract compensation that we do is heavily benchmarked against other communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's certainly not a, a situation where we don't look at what other contracts do and, and to make sure that our structure for how we pay, but also the rates are very much comparable with other communities. Um, that's something that we go into the process with. And we also go into the process with the whole concept of trying to get to a sustainable contract that doesn't, you know, alone. There tend to be three-year contracts as the standard. And so we would never want a scenario where a three-year contract would make our budget unsustainable from a levy limit standpoint. So we have to find other ways to fund those contracts in a way that matches comparable communities, but also doesn't break our budget. It is it is a tension point, but it is something that every school district mm -hmm. has to deal with, and we're kind of not alone there. So is that uh, the supervisor, is that like the head of a department that's not part of NETA, but? Principals. Principals, oh, okay. Jersey system principals. Yeah. And we're looking for two additional this year? Uh, not additional replacements. Replacement. We've had people moving on. Oh. Yep. Yeah. We have interims in place right now. Right. Can I ask one other? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Greg. No, no, no it's just going to reminding me that we were kind of going into the multi year, but let's finish <laughs> right. with your questions, then I'll come back to it. So I, well, I hate to go into the multi year until we've looked at the multi year. That's my concern. No that's problem. Fine. I'm sorry. The, the other question I had was with respect to the current budget. Yeah. Um, when I take the number of students, and I went back to 2022 since that's the only student enrollment we have. When I take the student number of students and divide it by the number of classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. I come out with very low numbers. Okay. In Essex, I come out with 14 people, students per class, and, and yeah. the high school, seven per class, at Memorial, 13 per class. And at the middle school, just under 20 per class. And I'm wondering why they're so low, or am I, is there something weird in my calculations? Okay, so there are two numbers when you're looking at um, there's what's called the faculty to student ratio, which is your total, your total certified teaching personnel. And we classify teaching personnel, so when you go to the decimal set, you're going to see a number, I believe, close to 9 to 1. That's the number of licensed teachers. So whether you're a guidance counselor, math teacher, uh, librarian, you go into that total faculty headcount. Is that on the classroom teacher line, or does that also include the classroom special classroom teacher ed? line, we have our lines divided, and okay. we don't have, we have additional personnel that also exist in grant funding. So the classroom, so there's, there's the total faculty heads to student heads. That is a lower number. When we start to parse out and look at the different um, class size averages for for building, it's I was working on this today. It's um, 18 at Memorial, 19 at Essex, average class size. So we arrive at that with the number of classroom sections. So two second grades, three third grades, whatever that combination is, and how the kids are divided. Um, so there are 18 and 19. We our benchmark is between 17 and 22. So we're on target there. Yes, we have a section that's at 14. We get into that situation because, well, to, to go up or down a class, either over inflates one to an unsustainable number, 
or you know, if you added a class, then it would be too small. So sometimes it doesn't always roll out perfectly. At the middle school, um, academic courses are averaging about 18 students, um, 18 to 20 students per class. And at the high school, our average number is about 16. And we do have um, some small cohort classes that are, some are under five, some are between five and 10. That's driven primarily um, because our schedule is it's designed by student choice, so students enroll for courses, some add, some drop. What we'll need to do is look at a two-year projection out as to whether or not we can run every AP course every year. Um, if it's not sustainable to do so with the number of students we have, then we're going to have to change our program offering for kids and basically tell them um, we'll offer AP once every other year, particular AP course, so you need to start to plan ahead in ninth grade. So that we're watching it. Um, we're looking at some comps. I don't believe we're performing very differently than other schools. So recap, 16 to 19 are our average class sizes. Uh, with the larger class sizes right now at the ele elementary, because that's where we'll be making our heads reductions. So there's been a lot of discussion about this. Our enrollment is going down, but our growth rate doesn't really change. Um, we, we looked at um, our staffing and broke it out by general ed and special ed, and what we what we see, what we looked at the other night is since uh, 19, I think our student enrollment has gone down about 11 or 12 percent, and our general ed teachers have declined about 9 percent. That's about one FTE decline for every 200 students, which is right in the middle of our benchmark. So things are seem to be jiving in terms of how we're managing the enrollment decline. The enrollment decline offset from the faculty decline gets wiped out because we've had increased need in student services and special education. And they don't run but on a pure enrollment driven formula. They run on identified need by their individual education plan. So the overwhelming majority of our um, students are on an IEP, a specialized plan, and they're serviced by a liaison, but they're placed in the, they're in inclusion classes. They're in the AP class. They're in the um, nine honors um, English class. So they, they don't have a standalone number. We have a series of specialized programs. I think we've talked to you about them before um, that are programs that we have on site for students who would likely otherwise be in one of district placements. So they're, called, and they're the right thing to do by students, first and foremost. Every student deserves to be educated in their hometown, in their hometown school. Um, but there's a real positive financial benefit to it because if they weren't here, they would be in an out-of-district placement. And what we're seeing now in our out-of-district placements is we're trending to the $100,000 mark um, with some pretty excessive uh, transportation costs on top of it. So we do have a series of specialized co courses, everything from the dyslexia program uh, to behavioral program to um, what we call severe special needs, so kids who have um, some real uh, physical challenges um, that they have to deal with. Those, co those sections require a higher degree of staffing and by state regs tap out between six and eight students per class. But I didn't include the special ed teachers in my no, calculation. No, I know you didn't. So what teachers are in the classroom teachers line that aren't teaching kids? Because these numbers are coming out much lower than what you're saying. So are there, are there people in the classroom teacher line who aren't really teaching? Or why, oh, why yes. do the numbers come out so much lower? I don't understand it. What, what I'm interventionists, right? Go ahead. Yeah, you have like, for example, interventionists who might not be special ed, but might be working like a, uh, like a, a math, math interventionist. Math okay. interventionist, for example, you have. Um, uh, we have, I think, at the one for the elementary level, one for the um, middle school, high school technology integrator. It's a standard position that you see in all districts, which is basically a person who makes sure that the teachers are understanding how to use all the technology that you have so it's not just sitting there and something that you buy doesn't get used well with baking it into instructional usage we have uh, specialists who teach things like art or um, uh, foreign uh, foreign foreign language is actually a class section so I wouldn't give that but um, our uh, music PE PE those are would all be in quote unquote classroom but they're sections that would be taught as sections so I guess they're teaching too. Just seems really weird to me. If you pull, 
I'll send you the presentation from last night. Everything is broken out into subcategories. So for content teachers of general education, we have 77.4. Yeah, those, are, um, those are teachers who would be assigned a core course like math, um, English, social studies, science, and uh, world language, seventh grade through twelfth grade. You'd be a classroom teacher of grade two at the elementary. And then for specialist teachers, and the specialist teachers class size will be at K eight builds off whatever the classroom teachers class size is because they move as a cohort throughout the building. So if I'm in grade two with 18 kids in my class, my art class is going to be 18 kids because we're going to pick up and we're going to go to the art room all together. Um, so for general... So you have two, two teachers for that class of 18. Yes, and when teacher, you get to the high school, okay. it's important to think about the fact that students at the high school take, on average, six and a half courses. We'll have students who have six courses. We'll have students who are taking eight courses. It takes approximately 1.2 to 1.4 teachers per 20 student schedules, right? It, it's a higher level because they're taking more than just the typical five standard class course. And then they're broken. And then when you get into the scheduling of it, we have over 201 sections running at the, at the high school for academic courses. So then there's other subdivisions. And those subdivisions and those... Um, pathway courses start to create the inequities. So we'll have a class of 28 and then you'll have a, potentially a class of seven. So that's why we really try to look at the average because we do get the outliers. Um, but some of that's driven by the fact that I'm trying, you know, my schedule, I'm probably, I may be trying to take chorus and French AP and um, a comp sci AP. And all of those classes don't always mesh well together. So sometimes we'll have to put a kid into an independent study on a line if they can't make it in. So there's a lot of variations. We're going to study it a little bit deeper and see if there's something we can do uh, with schedules going forward if enrollment continues to trend the way it is. I think we're starting to see it flatten out. We're, we essentially have lost the 27% gain that we experienced from about, I think it started climbing around not 2009, 2010. It went up pretty sharply through 14, 15, and has started to come back down. Do, uh, so some classrooms have <coughs> teacher's assistants in addition to the head teacher. Are the teacher's assistants in the faculty Te number? Or teacher's no? assistants aren't in the faculty number. They should be down below, but we have a cadre of them that are also grant funded. Okay. Uh, we have a very small handful of what we call general ed TAs, so that's like a kindergarten teaching assistant. Yeah. Um, the majority of our uh, teacher assistants or special education. And that's where we see one of the largest growth growth areas. It's a 35% growth in TAs from 19 to 24. Those directly relate to the specialized programs because severe students tend to need a one-on-one. -on -one. could be anything from a medical assist to um, you know, a directional or behavioral assist. The old programs tend to have um, additional hands in them and sometimes two teachers. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I No, I think it's, it's a good question. It's been coming up, and yeah, we're happy to I just have one question, to too. On the yeah. enrollment page, on the budget package, page 15, it talks about school choice out. Mm -hmm. And those numbers have run about, I think it's 11 this year, 14, 15. Does that include special ed, or is that people who basically live in town but decide to go to Gloucester or go some other school, and we mm -hmm. compensate yes. for that? Okay. Um, we don't pay out, it just gets reduced from our Chapter 70 in. Um, and what we, in looking at that number, we, you know, we've always had someone who might choose Gloucester because there's um, some tech ed, tech ed programming there. We're seeing more, a few more heads go to online programs. The state has some, um, like they call it TECA, they have an online uh, program, which if you enroll in the state program, it's considered a school choice option and the money will funnel to them. So not everyone hated, <laughs> be, no. you know, being online during, it, it, it really is a fit for some kids and, and they opt into that. Wow. It was a little higher though during the COVID phase and mm -hmm. it's kind of come back down from about 15, 16 kids down to 11. Mm -hmm. You can see the historical numbers. And so I did want to make sure you could see on page 16 of the full budget document, you may not have it with you. 
but you just referenced that you only had the enrollment for 22. We do try to include the historical enrollment as well, just because we know people like to look at those trends. Mm -hmm. So that's one place you can go if you want to see what's happened in prior years. Yeah. And do you track also who's in private? Uh, well, it has we become something that we've talked about this year quite extensively um, at school committee level. Uh, the, answer, the short answer is we do track it through an opt-in response process where private, you know, we ask people to provide that information at private schools. Some do, some don't, and we have tracked that. Um, and so we've run some reports because that question has come up about, you know, what's our sense of how that's changed over time. Yeah. Your sense is it's running pretty stable. Yeah. Uh, it runs very stable. Um, K eight is almost uh, rock solid is probably too strong, but it it's pretty flat. We are we're experiencing a spike right now is between eighth and ninth grade, and we're trying to sort through what that's about. Um, lots of theories, but the the high school is working through their school council is going to be surveying kids, doing an exit survey if people are choosing. Um, out uh, to private schools, taking a look at the different private schools and what they have to offer. You know, small space. They have small class sizes, small faculty student ratios. They promote that. Um, but we know sometimes, like St. John's, it could be their athletic program. It could be uh, philosophy of the school. So we're going to try to dig in and see um, if we can learn and if it's something that we can address in our programming in any way. What causes us to have school choice students with special ed tuition out? I would think they would get the same special ed education out whether they were in our district or their original district. So sometimes, I think this is one of the things we, we talk a little bit about every year, which is when we, do, when we offer school choice seats, it's a blind lottery. It's not an application process. We don't know this. We know the students' names because their parents fill out a form that says, "I'd like to be placed into the lottery." So literally every year we put numbers in a hat and we pick those numbers out, and the numbers correspond to the name on the list. So what has happened in a few instances, Sarah, is students have um, choiced into the district and had a profile where they were hopeful that they may be able to go into one of our specialized programs or didn't have a, a, didn't have identified needs when they arrived or left because they were having not getting the needs met in the school they were in some various things and then it's been our assessment that we either don't have room in the current program or we don't have a program that fits the complexity of the profile and then they would be placed in an out of district placement that's done with the knowledge of the sending school and it's built back to the sending town yeah. but because they've choiced in, we manage that case until they graduate. Yep. And we do not, for that reason, include those numbers in our out of district uh, numbers, certainly not in the budget. Um, that's, okay. yep. That number will be reimbursed as in the subsequent year to the school choice revenue receiving. And so we charge those tuitions to that fund and know that the money will get paid back in the subsequent year. And that can account, by the way, for small variations in the school choice balance, by the way, that you'll see, yep. because we try to keep the spending stable to the kids who are coming in that we get for that year, but that waiting for that uh, reimbursement can have a, a small impact on that balance. So that management is really an administrative financial management, not a school program, IEP, whatever. It's not teacher involved, it's administrative and financial, right? Yeah, it would be the director of SPED, um, or director of student services, and a team chair, because we do manage the IEP. Okay. So we'll have to send our team to like to the um, to the school att they're attending to do the annual event and run and participate in those meetings. And of the school of the school choice students not out of district placements, but what percentage are in in-house special programs? The last time I did that analysis, school choice in students ran at the same about the same percentage find as our typical uh, as our resident students. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so it's around it will trend between fifteen and eighteen percent.
on the positive side of special ed, um, when we're talking tuitions, is we do um, have our programs are attractive to other communities, and we try to, whenever possible, whether we're sending a student out or searching for a placement for a student or working with a partner group, we'll place students into other public schools, which is a uh, cost savings to the town um, and to the district. And we have two or three um, tuition in students to our programs. So when we're undersubscribed in our specialized programs, we can um, accept students from other districts. It's not an application process. It's typically from one student services director to another, someone looking for a placement. Um, and then we will charge them. Avi uh, collaborates with Allison, but their tuition is individual student cost of program. Yeah. So per head cost of program. So it's a little revenue for us. Any other questions? Detail well, questions on the I was wondering about on the state aid number. Do, do we request an amount from the state and just see what percentage they give us, or it's just whatever they give us? It's a formula. There is a formula. So it's a formula that's driven not by us, but by uh, our enrollment and the makeup of our enrollment, composition between grade level, as well as um, general ed versus special ed, and um, uh, also some uh, statistics around income level that all go into a statewide formula that is applied to everyone, as well as, most importantly, income base of the communities. And so uh, that is definitely a factor. The state assumes that based on the income level of the member communities, uh, X percent of what the, the formula would otherwise dictate will be covered by them. So we tend to be a minimum aid community. And that, that number doesn't really get finalized till pretty late in the process. Yeah, sometimes right. July, sometimes after July. <laughs> and we're pretty good on estimating it, though. I mean, it's it's gotten there. a little better, yeah. And um, we are at a point where we typically are eligible only for the minimum aid, right. which has typically been around thirty dollars per student. Last year, it was sixty dollars per student. Um, so even if your enrollment is going down. They guarantee some level of increase, understanding that costs will increase. But for us, that's still been in the, you know, one to one and a half percent level, which is below, you know, normal inflation of costs. So, has not been the best news out of state aid. We are keeping an eye on a couple of things and working with our legislators, um, see if they can provide us any relief for. For escalating costs and for, you know, we are in negotiations to talk a little bit about salaries. Um, you, you know, the state teachers union is using that 8% inflation number. So I think there are a lot of asks in terms of they, that millionaire's tax went through. There is projected revenue. The state's having a good year. So there's some discussion in accelerating the full funding of the Student Opportunity Act, which is supposed to make adjustments to the Chapter 70 formula. We'll never be, it'll never be a windfall for us. It would be a very incremental gain, but there's potential for some additional funds there. Where we're really lobbying hard is, um, I, oh, is it ODD or OO? Oh, 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 out of oh. district. No, no, no. Oh. Um, the state agency that sets OSD. tuition limits, OSD, Operational approved a 14% COLA for all out of district tuitions. So I believe that's somewhere between two fifty and $300,000 increase for us. I know we have increased um, circuit breaker funds that are going to offset some of that. It, it, it just happened to play out just right for us. Mm. But, you know, our neighbors, like I'm talking to Pentucket and Triton, uh, we sit on the board together. Um, they're looking to make cuts to offset uh, this increase. We're hopeful we might get some short-term relief. Um, new administration, people seem to be wanting to work together. so. We're going to hope and we're going to continue to work with them and meet with them throughout March as they're forming the budget to see if we can get um, some additional funding. So fingers crossed that we get a little something else um, from the state this year. One other question. Um, Go ahead. I know one of our wild cards is health care. <laughs> and we always are trying to figure out when the health care number comes rolling in relative to town meeting. Do you have any insights on that? Because I know it's a big driver for your programs. We never really know until April. Where That's we have ten percent right. right now. Uh, we have twelve percent assumption in the budget. Um, I think it's high, but uh, so I'm optimistic it can come down. 
but it's based on what our brokers are saying is the average um, for district or communities, it's not districts, uh, any clients who are running at medical trend, in the past it's been six to 8%. If your utilization is worse, you get above that number. If your utilization is better, you get below that number. And that's been the standard range you've heard me talk about for years. Mm -hmm. We asked them what the impact of inflation would be, and they said eight to 12% is the range. We recommend you start at 12%. Um, and see what happens. And so we're in the same process we have every year, which is monitoring claims on a month by month basis. We're running um, pretty well, but you know, uh, we're running pretty well. We've had some years where it's been worse. We have to also look at the large losses, which go through a reinsurance pool, um, but still can impact you. And those are better than last year, but still being looked at. So we're going to have more information in the coming months, one month at a time, as new return data comes in. Uh, so that could be an area where we see some potential savings, um, and we're going to be monitoring that. You have a question on that, Mike? Yeah, can I? Yeah, I got, I got one more question here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a bit, it's back to reserves, I guess. Okay. And I'll... And I'll preface the question by saying that, you know, I, I, I get that dipping into reserves, you know, uh, every year or continually is a bit of kicking the can down the road, right? Eventually, you run out of cash in the bank account. I get that, right? But my question is this. What, what would the reserve balance look like if we did it one more year, quote, unquote, both in percentage term, you know, what would the cash reserve balance be? What would the dollar of that be? You know, would it be 8%, 7%, you know, 2 million bucks, whatever. And I assume we're talking about, like you said, that number is the 757,000. Yeah. That's the dollar delta above and beyond the three and a half, right? That's exactly right. And then you would add to that uh, 1.2 million for fields plus the other about 200,000 that's going out for committed projects. So let's just say it's 1.5, it's about 2.2 .2 out of the. Um, 3.4. I mean, it's a pretty significant number. Um, now, granted, if we didn't have that correction, we would probably, rather than just putting in $756,000 of reserves, given that we've been talking about it for three years and trying to plan ahead, I don't think I would feel like it would be so prudent to just kick it down the, the can down the, uh, down the road, even a, another, well, let me be simple. Yes, we could kick it down the road another year. I think the question is, would it be that way with some type of assurance that we, it would only be a year? Because if it's just an indefinite postponement, at some point it starts to become, I think, unwise and not prudent to just hope that something happens with one-time money. So I don't think yes. I don't think we're at a I, dollars and cents wise. You're right; it's not necessarily make or break this year. But given that we've been talking about three years and numbers are going up and the capital needs are going out the door. And we've got Essex needs that are coming. I do think it would be imprudent to kick it down the road another year. Just help me get on the map real quick because you did it too quick for me. So I start with what, subtract what, subtract what? Oh, uh, well, we're at 520. So we 757000 is one cost plus $1.5 million in capital needs. That's $2.2 2 So if we're looking and at... And I subtract, subtract, subtract that from... The 3.411. Three point four, so three four minus two two, so the remainder would be like one point two, roughly. Right, so you're down to one point two, and probably not enough to cover your gap for the following year, or okay. anything else. Unless you did the debt exclusion for the fields. Unless you did the debt exclusion. Yep. Which would be. Yeah. Uh, yep. Right. Yep. That's right. But that gap will continue to grow. So we'll I think I, I up to at least yeah. nine fifty for the next year. I mean, <laughs> Dude, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too off topic because this is obviously based on the school stuff. But you know, there is stuff on the town side that looks good, you know, in the near future from a revenue side. So, you know, what I mean, so they can down the road a little bit actually can time up with some positive side there. So, so probably worth mentioning. For, you know, we are we have the two towns to manage through this as well. Um, and I think as you're looking at the apportionment and what the impact is and the affordability for Manchester, the more we kick it down the road, that numbers get escalating for Essex. 
and the correction number for them is escalating. So I, if you anyone heard some of the conversation um, last night, there there's a lot of stress in the number that we're presenting this year and this in the size of the potential ask after apportionment uh, just with this number. So if we knowingly let's say we all agreed we're going to put in seven hundred fifty thousand dollars this year, you know I'm I'm not giving you the Excel version of the number, but just my Past, practice, past experience, that number is going up next year to at least 950 or a million dollars, right? Because we're at 550 this year. So now you're starting with a gap of a million dollars and likely we'll may have to make some nips, tucks, and cuts this year with potential ask for more putbacks. So I think, I think we need to consider that as well when we're, we're thinking about the strategy, that there's another town and right now they're on they're on the side of it where if it's a 5% or 6% for you, it's a 9% for them. And it, and it only grows faster. So always open to ideas and discussion. I think there's also the issue of timing mm -hmm. and putting some distance between an operational correction mm -hmm. and a capital ask for a new school. Um, I'm not sure I want to be the person on the podium one year apart between those two. That's <laughs> some distance in the middle is probably healthy. <laughs> and as Avi was saying before, and, and Greg, you're always great at bringing this up in terms of a strategy. Um, are we better served with the, the known smaller corrections? And we've already let it get bigger than it probably needs to be. Um, and go on that, maybe that three or five year cycle where it's it's a, it's a check and balance with the community. We have to go out. We have to explain it. We have to have a conversation amongst all of the groups to get there. But when we do let it go to 10 years, that number just it just grows and grows. Um, and, it's, and it feels like a bigger hill to climb. I mean, I'm open, I'm open we, to either idea, but we, I think there's some wisdom in it. We have been trying to take an approach of taxing in the current year for money we have to spend and not taxing extra and squirreling it away mm -hmm. and to keep for future years because we got to a point where our reserve balance had just gotten too high so we've been spending down the reserve for the past few years so that we're not overtaxing the taxpayers for future expenditures. If we can help. More page you got Yeah, and then mm -hmm. on that note, which may be a way to come back to Greg's point before about the numbers on the slide that talk about uh, what the total ask might be beyond the $756,000, I don't think that we are asking for, you know, multiple years of funding up front to put into, for example, our reserve account and wait to use it. But the question was, might you, if you go for an operational override, ask for an appropriation up to a certain amount and then tax it as you need it on a given basis so that amount could be meet it out to us each year, but you've already got that override, so you wouldn't necessarily tax up to the override capacity in year one, but you would have an override authorization that was big enough to allow you to address, let's just say it's a three-year plan, year two and year three, and then we would build our budget, we would go back to that three and a half percent level, and it would allow for potential overage over that number if there's a, you know, an additional gap you might have pre-authorized. We certainly are not advocating to put money into reserves uh, based on an override. So that's, if you look at the scenarios number, I think when you see that the 756,000 could be 1.4 million at the bottom, that would be based off the assumption that you, there's an additional need for the year two, year three, um, beyond year one, if you're trying to not come back for until a fourth year, for example. So, our assessment of the what's our assessment of the seven hundred fifty-six thousand? Well, right now Maybe it's five point four three. <clears throat> That's right, and we're actually going to update the assessments. I mean, we certify the apportionment. Uh, 30 days after the budget is voted per the regional agreement. We try to give real-time updates as we know them. Mm -hmm. We have the, um, 
EQV equalized property valuation just came out. It's a biannual update that's 25% of our number. So we're going to run that through just so we can give an update. So that will help us. But it, <laughs> but well, it's, Essex is it's, going up too. <laughs> but it's pretty nearly two thirds, one third. I mean, you know, we always get worried about the decimal points kind of here and there, but it comes in pretty darn close. Well, the equalized valuation well, is 75%. In Essex, oh, it's 25% informal. Yeah. I guess my only comment to that, Maury, though, is if you look at the past couple of years for Manchester, I'm looking at 3.34 assessment growth, 2.76, 2.94, 3.24, 2 2.05. Those are pretty tight ranges and pretty good numbers, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of sustainability. Essex has gone from 3.230 to 3.6 to 3.96 to 4.39. So even though it's small numbers, it, those little changes can make a big difference for them. And that's been primarily off of the enrollment input more than anything else, as we've seen that the percentage of the pie has shifted uh, slightly towards Essex. Oh. I really want to make sure we're careful on that. The percentage of the pie doesn't, I mean, they are assuming a larger portion of it. That's what I meant to say. Okay. <laughs> they're still paying less per student. Yes. Right. They're not overtaking the pie. The it, denominator's it, getting it, smaller. It is a, it is a very small move. Mm -hmm. yeah. they're, it's a heavy burden for them, and it's moving their number. But I don't see us positioning where Manchester ever becomes a smaller piece. Well, we were, I mean, that's kind of the dynamic that we were seeing five years ago and before. Mm -hmm. you know, so we, yes. We were bearing more of that you know, relative, that's right. relative burden. That is true. Yeah. So I, we get it. Yep. Well, this is where the enrollment boom happened. Yeah. Right? We, uh, just tracking against the two elementary schools, because they're the most simple to follow, yeah. we were increasing. I mean, we were at 435 students at Memorial when we were going into um, filing our SOA. You know, we had kids in closets and converted locker rooms because we were out of space. At Essex, we never we never peaked over 289, 290. We added one more section over that time. So they net, you grew, you felt the boom in your assessments, and you are now kind of feeling the decline yeah. and the yeah. decline in your assessments. Well, didn't we have a, a significant increase in the student population when the when the uh, middle and high school opened. Yep. It's right around that yeah, time. Yeah, but it came in at elementary. But I think what Pam's saying is right now, that's, right now we're at about 230 we, at the Memorial, right. give or take, and we were at 400. But now, does that account for the fact that Memorial Middle School picked up another grade or two? Okay. So no. that's basically population shift through the system. Yeah, you're exiting you're exiting kids out of the system that aren't coming back and, in. And you didn't grade. see an increase at Memorial when you opened the new school. You didn't see a bump up. We from what I can see in the numbers, the when you open the middle high school, you your biggest bump. increase came in at, at elementary school. Okay. So whether what is in, whether it was an anticipation of it or yeah. it also yeah. coincided with that housing boom bust. Okay. Um, and I know Linda used to, Linda Crosby used to theorize that um, there just became a, a greater availability and ability yeah. to buy in, and we had a lot of, you know, empty nests refilled, and it was just a, a kind of a boom time. We did look at, um, you know, we do track like the private school number. The head count is fairly steady. Mm -hmm. The percentages are bumping up and down because of the decline in the overall population. But even if you go back to those uh, boom years where kids were coming back, we still had about an 80-20 split by the time they got to high school mm -hmm. of kids electing by. I think it's part of the culture. Mm -hmm. So, there, you know, it's pretty steady, but I think that boom is, I don't think there's an, you don't have a ton of inventory, to my knowledge. We've got an increase in population, though. I mean, we've had an increase in population. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the census well, numbers it, are pretty consistent. I thought it went I mean, up from like 5,300 to 5,500. That's a... Increase. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, um, to your point, one other comment about the school. If you, there is a slide, uh, number, sorry, a page of the full budget document on page 14 which yeah. shows the enrollment. And when you look at the resident proportion, um, you can see in grade one and two, those were kind of anomalous years where um, the numbers uh, 
for um, Essex were right around the same as Manchester in those years only. If you yeah. look at grades three and up, it's much more that you know two thirds, one third that Maury's talking about. But when you look at K, uh, it is back to that normal traditional level. So it's kind of a little early to be identifying trends. I can tell you when grade one and two numbers were looked at in Essex, seeing that their apportionment's going up, it definitely created some heart palpitations in terms of how the apportionment shakes out. Um, but I think when you look at the K number, could that be a sign of the new building? It, it sure. could be, uh, but we just don't know yet. It's just too early, I think, to draw right. conclusions. So I, at least it's good to see that kind of reverting back to the more typical level. I think what we know historically too, and memorials, um, we tend to see our largest increase at elementary when they come into first grade. There was always a big jump, almost a 9% jump from K to one. Mm -hmm. and I, would attribute that anecdotally to people choosing early childhood care that they like and staying with it through K and then entering a grade one. We know people were choosing, I mean, the COVID years were difficult for all, you know, I mean, people chose a lot of other options when coming to school here wasn't one. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how things might shake out over the next few years as we restabilize and people may come back from options they choose chose when they when COVID. We had some immediate in and outs, but I think I think we may see some return at different pivot points, like sixth grade or ninth grade, as the years move on. Go ahead. I was just going to say, have you had anybody coming in at pre-K or K and then leaving the system? Because, and I'm just thinking, it's one thing to put a, a first, second, or third grader in a car and drive them 20 minutes to here or there. It's a totally different deal to um, do it with a pre k or. Do you see that shift or not? Once they're in pre-K or K, do they stay in the system or do you have people leaving? Typically. And we don't have a full universal pre-K yet, so people are choosing the pre-K as a child care option. Right. So the pre-K the pre is at its base um, a special education inclusion program where we offer it um, to ensure that young students who need services can get them here. Otherwise, those can be out of district placements or contracted service care um, for those kids. We augment the program with general ed students who are willing to pay a tuition. Um, with the new building, I mean, Sarah Wolf was spoke to this um, the other night. At one point we were looking at should we build four pre-K classrooms because we think we can, we thought we could fill them um, with students and we were, into, we were and we still are anticipating a mandate that will come sooner probably rather than later that we need to offer universal pre-k that being said we we received some uh, community innovation grant money cic money and we built up the general ed component of the day by underwriting its expansion with the grant funds so we could collect tuition for a few years and now the revolving will take it over um, so we've expanded it to the extent we can but we're out of physical space if you look at page um, 15 of the full budget detail, where you can see the enrollment history by grade, that was the slide. It is interesting to see the pre-K enrollment in the current year of 33 students. And if you go all the way up the years, it's much bigger than it has been. So that's been a real success, um, especially because we are, you know, the, the special ed component is a mandated service. Mm -hmm. um, and but the the growth of the tuition paying students has grown and as we're saying you know it definitely helps to introduce families who are beginning to figure out their options to see what our schools are like and also the new school shows well as well so that's been great the fact that we are kind of at capacity i think does you know raise the question of what we might do down the road to you know mm -hmm. think about expansion we're, we're not at there yet but i think that that has been a bright spot um and certainly those uh, tuition dollars help to offset taxpayer costs for sure. Get back to the scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. So the higher numbers are with the higher it's scenarios. It's, it's right. just, yeah. So I think we'll have to I'm still trying to put my arms around getting authorization for higher 
exclusion but not using it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I was under the impression that's a doable thing. I don't know. Um, because I think that that was one of, part of the discussions that we had had was that that was an option. I mean, again, I would kind of lean towards uh, your yeah, understanding of the tax recast process. Well, right. If you think about the school, though, Greg, that was an authorization. It was different because it's capital, but that was an authorization that was funded over multiple years, incurred over multiple years. It wasn't all paid for the first year. Right, there was an authorization to borrow X. We had an yeah. X. Mm -hmm. We had a dollar amount. But this is operating. It's just different. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, it would be a permitting. What's different, primarily to my understanding, you understand this way better than me, but it's, right. a, permanent, it's a permanent adjustment, mm -hmm. but just you never have to tax up to the levy limit capacity, was my understanding. Or beyond it. What? Or beyond it. You certainly can't go beyond it without right. another vote, but right. so that was my understanding was that you would you might have that option to to increase. That's like when we didn't use the levy limit in twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. So we have excess levy capacity. That's there's no problem. Three and a half percent. Yeah, you're certainly allowed to have excess levy capacity. Can you yes. increase that capacity for the school for override? Just to have it for the future. Yeah. Uh, so I'd have to verify that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you can do that for debt. Where when we land on our final number, which I think is not what board and well, not there any of the committee members, but I think my feeling from the other night is we're not going to, it's not going to be the full read state and stabilize. Does Manchester even need an override to fund it when you break it up for these questions? Well, we haven't finished our budget yet. <laughs> we're in deep trouble. <laughs> It's just, it's just a question. Was, I mean, yeah. you know. right? I mean, what, what is, what do we raise with 1%? What do we raise uh, in taxes? 270. That's what I thought, yeah. This 280, 270. 290, aren't we at? 20 is closer to 290 now, actually. 29, yeah. yeah. You know, same what I'm saying, sir, if you're on a just pay as you go, if the number is, let's call it, maybe we end on 850. It, once you apportion out 850, is the number that you end up with something that's actually within your operating or your resources to fund, which is the probably likely the reverse of where we were back in the 15, 16 era, right. where right. Essex didn't, we had a failed override in 2012, and we came back in 15, 16 to do it. Essex said, we're not putting it out on the ballot again. You're giving us a number, we're going to figure out how to manage <coughs> The extra this year to fund it. So I, I think what well, I guess I'm inartfully trying to say is we're not asking you to do something that you don't need to do. It's we're trying to make the case that we think it's a good idea to correct for the use of reserves this year and not include that as an offset. And the number we give to you, it, it, you you need to tell us how you want to handle it um, and how we need to work with you to get you to the point where you feel like you have the options you need. Do we have numbers shown in the public safety stuff? We no. want one uh, of worst, worst case scenario is probably a net of uh, 300 would be the worst case. I'm sort of seeing foggy territory at town meeting where mm -hmm. we have Brook Street Field that we may not know about, so that may be an authorization, but a carryover. Well, so that's capital, so that can just that's carry capital. Forward. It can carry I, over. But I would just I would fund that because it fits in the capital budget. Right. Yeah, it's in so budget. then you yeah. can check that off, and you don't have to worry about it. Right. And it seems like it makes sense to deal with an operational override for operating for the school to put some distance between other things that come along, but can that get absorbed? And I don't know. I think this question about levy limit and how you do it is interesting, um, but it needs to be explained. Oh yes, yeah, I'm meeting for really floor. carefully explained. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, I had a question Thank you very about, much, Maury. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you get paid the big bucks over there. <laughs> if assessments are in, how much are they up? I mean, I think land value has gone up quite a bit. Recently. That's why your tax rate went down. Right, right. right. The tax rate went down. Right. So but our out. dollar, our tax, the, the amount, amount of pay in taxes same. went up. Right, right, right. <laughs> but it's the percent. Um, so we're, it was 3.2% increase this year. Yeah. 
because it was 2.5 for the town and then the 0.7 for the school. That's correct. Um, Mechanical question about the reserve funds. So our reserve fund, we kind of target 10% of our overall budget. Um, the school has a reserve fund. You're targeting roughly 10% of your budget. So their budget is in our budget, effectively. And so we have sort of reserve fund upon reserve fund. You know, I, which, I which if we're two thirds of the yeah. cost, then two thirds of their reserve budget. Right, right. I mean, there's some overlap there. I mean, mm -hmm. you need your yes. reserve fund to spend as you yep. see fit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, you know, questioning that. It's just a matter of, you know, a little bit of overlap there. So, so I, I always view this as sort of the separation of they are, um, they are another like business yeah. that we contribute to as is Essex does. And so they really have to operate within their own circles, although we obviously collaborate and get a lot of advice back and forth. But at the end of the day, what really happens is they give us a debt number and an operating number. And we have to, we have to fit that into our model, and right. it's year by year by year. But, but, but Andy's right? yes, but Andy's comment is that our reserve, 10% of our operating budget includes their budget. Right. Their budget. Which is so half the budget. Technically, you could subtract that out. Which is half the yeah. budget. As you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I like to no. carry a bigger reserve, so I would not <laughs> ever do that. So I'm arguing against myself. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, full disclosure, I mean, Andy's yeah, yeah. correct. Right. Oh, Andy, how could you be correct? <laughs> That's what I want to know. I would be concerned if we didn't have the ability to handle emergency. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. You, you need your reserve based on your financials. I'm, it probably more comes to our side. Do we really need to carry 10% of the, our portion of the school budget? Because, right. Right. Yes. You know, as in right. our reserve fund. Yeah. And um, it's a mechanical question. Like if they have yeah. two boilers blow up and a roof collapse, we're having a town meeting in the middle of November at yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think we've really tried to, over the years, model our thinking and our process around reserves around what we do need yeah. in, in our conversations. So um, just in case others are listening, we're, what, when we think about CFIT, we really are using it to make sure we're not going back to that meeting, the town meeting, that, you know, the oops with the water line, the bridge issue, that yeah. what would become a two-town debate if we had to go to two meet, town meetings something we can just manage and bring, bring to a close rather quickly. Uh, Mike, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I just I just wanted to kind of second what Andy said. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it just seems 10% on top of 10%. And, you know, if the school district needs that 10% for the reasons they just said for the emergency capital, then it just, you know, maybe we need 8% on the town side because then the cash is actually a little bit closer to where it needs to be at the end of the day anyways, right? Or well, what Andy's suggesting is we do the 10% on our operating budget and not include the school's operating budget. Right. Well, oh, right. Mathematically, I think we get to the same place. So we yeah. say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Agreed. Yeah. We'll have to consider that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's shocking that uh, sort of the uh, the reduction scenario, the first column, still results in a 5.37% Essex increase. That is shocking. And so that's the apportionment differential. And so another thing, so I did talk earlier about the fact that what we try to do is engage in multi-year analysis. So if we're not yeah. springing a, a surprise on anybody when it comes to some type of a correction, I think similarly, um, we've been talking about just what that apportionment looks like because it's hard for us to manage the budget to hit each town's individual numbers. So just to give a specific example, last year we were talking about the fact to, to get Essex down uh, to, you know, from their apportioned number to, an, to something that might be easier for them we'd have to cut $3 for every $1, you know, sorry, or two, get yeah, $3 for every $1 uh, from our spending just to get them that $1 of savings. So um, as a result, we really try to ask that the communities hold us accountable for our average assessment and not for what happens with apportionment, which is really who's quote unquote riding the bus. I think it would be easier if, as the student 
head count changes, we have people move from one town to the other. <laughs> so, uh, to become one big town. <laughs> Regionalized town. Yeah. Transportation is a little expensive right now, by the way, so <laughs> once you're, bus drivers are hard to find. That's all right, everybody drives their kids to school these days. <laughs> No, there's a bus that goes by me that has four kids on it. Yep. And three of them are dropped off by my house. There's one that goes to the, there's only one student on it that is, this is elementary school, that is probably required to be on the bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, did to, we, did, we, we did try to, we did try to, we have done root consolidation in the past year. Yeah. Um, and we tried to look at what that scenario would be like in Manchester, because there's two routes, one that goes down, um, uh, the road towards Beverly, one that goes yep. up towards Gloucester, it, it, plus all the places like, in between. Yeah. And you'd have a kid really on the bus for, you know, about an hour is what yeah. we saw to get someplace that's about a seven minute drive away. So, um, I can get to work in an hour. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar with that. If I can ask a question of the group, like in our conversations with, with ethics, we're hearing a lot of suggestions and ideas and ask and asks for things to think about in terms of kind of major restructuring. Yeah. Um, we haven't had a lot of Manchester um, folks in the room in those conversations. I'm just wondering if you're hearing anything similar in terms of wanting something markedly different um, out of the schools and what we're doing. In terms of services. In terms of services. Yeah. I'm not hearing anything. From the man, from Manchester. And I would think the school committee would probably hear. We, yes, we do hear a lot. Yeah. From the parents. Yes. Well, from the parents, we're hearing we would like to see a performing arts coordinator. We, why aren't we considering putting back the librarian? Still some residual concern around elementary. Those types of not program quality. Not we need to you know work with our teachers to do some things differently in their classroom. But you know, do we need to offer AP? Should we be doing? doing things online. I'm just curious if anything's making its way towards you because we are getting those questions from the, the Essex boards. I mean, the, the Manchester parents are also concerned about the quality as well. So I think all the things that the Essex uh, residents they were raising the other day, it was the last night, um, they're the same on the Manchester side. But it's, uh, it's just the Manchester residents or the parents, though, uh, not as vocal, I would say. But there are a lot of concerns at the moment. Um, and I do think that is legitimate. It's always good. Like, you know, for example, the Essex um, residents were raising the other day that um, the last time that we look at the, the program structure and whatnot was more than 10 years ago. And a lot has happened for the past 10 years. And it might have impact, you know, the enrollments and whatnot. So it's probably good to do like an assessment to see the quality, to see if we are, you know, have the operation of excellence and whatnot, um, but it's probably good to look at um, on the Manchester side as well. Mm -hmm. And if, if you were talking about the person um, on Zoom at the meeting last night, that was a Manchester selectman. Yeah. Member of the Manchester yeah. board of selectmen, not an Essex parent. No, even the Essex, um, the people at the Essex, like the people that were there in person. In the room. Yeah. yeah. I, I did hear that 10 year number from um, a member of our select board. The biggest uh, gripe I heard from Manchester is the fields. I'm very happy to, that that's in the budget this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had to make clear that whatever strategy we're pursuing uh, financially yeah. is getting done. I just want to go on the record, and you may, this probably, it did happen before you came on the board. We just finished our high school accreditation. So it has it went through a three year external review by um, New England Association of School Counselors. So we have reviewed our program and actually got excellent reviews from them. And it created the blueprint for the strategic plan. So that was also a check in with the community. So I think we have a lot of data. Um, what I'm hearing, and I may be wrong, is really more um, should we be limiting options for kids? Should we be reorganizing the schedule and the program at the secondary? Can, to answer part of your question about um, concerns around class. But there was a, a lot of concerns raised in Manchester with the elimination of the foreign mm -hmm. languages, so that would seem that they don't want foreigners to be introduced. 
food, enrichment, peace of spirit. That's what I think this is. Or you like any other school. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't have it. So I will toss out, and it's a, it, the data point is old and it's direct, but it's from a graduating class of 2015 with <coughs> two boys and all their cohorts. And they, to the letter, say they were very, very well prepared for the college environments they went into, and particularly in writing and um, presentations and all that. And although they labored in that through 10th, 11th and 12th grade, <laughs> they, in engineering schools and liberal arts schools, were felt they were way ahead of their peers. And, and, and this anecdotal data comes from nine friends of our boys, including their two, who were very well prepared. So again, that's seven years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think it speaks, it speaks well to what's going on, or was going on, hopefully still going on. So. And I feel like we, we, COVID was difficult for us. Yeah. And we did not have all the answers. And we gave it our best effort, but it certainly didn't our typical quality level. Um, I don't know any, I haven't talked to anybody who's in this business that feels like that was everybody's best moment. I think everyone did the best they could. I think we're still coming out of it. Um, nobody had the answers. Nobody had the answers. So I think as we, this is our real first stable normal year after that. And I think as two and three years out, I think we're going to return to hopefully a little bit more stability. But it's definitely a different climate exiting than it was going in. Does the school district have any kind of feedback other than anecdotal stuff beyond 2015 for that, though? Yeah, kind we did. success a, rates we have in colleges and so forth? Um, yes, uh, and the state publishes some of that as well. So we can definitely... Specific to Manchester. They, re, they report on each district, not so much um, like where they end up after college, but they will report on um, longevity of college because the enter, the start, finish, completion rates. Um, that's definitely an area we could build out, which is more alumni relations mm -hmm. um, and development. Mm -hmm. We're pretty tightly staffed, so we don't always have the people to take on the projects, but um, it is something that, like I said, this year we're starting to do a little bit more proactive, you know, with with some board encouragement around um, kids who may be exiting for private school. I could see that is definitely an area of growth for us. I think our strategic plan gave us a lot of feedback. That was. Um, toward the end of COVID when we were getting prepared to come out of it and, and that was a lot around program and design and what people wanted to see out of, um, out of the district. And all indicators in that was some expansion and some reinvention of programming and I think that's what we've tried to line up in the plan. So, so what, um, sorry if I missed it, but what has been the Essex feedback on the two scenarios? No, I think no, no, I'm trying to think how to meeting. articulate it. <laughs> it was very clear. <laughs> I think sharpen the pencil, bring it in as low as possible, yeah. Yeah. and they feel very constricted in their town by two and a half. They feel like they live at two and two and a half, and yeah. I think there's a not. Yes, the answer for yourself. I, I hear acknowledgement of the reality that if you you know you, you download the per pupil expenditure chart and you run it for the state, three point eight is kind of is the number that emerges, at least the last time we did it, but we don't, any way you slice the data, we aren't moving in any different direction than any other school. We're not, district, we're not really putting up much higher numbers. We may have a year when we're 3-2 and a year that we're 4, and that seems to be pretty consistent. Whether you slice the data on our dark districts, on high, our high-performing districts, we're all in it together, and enrollment's declining. In, in most white communities. And even though enrollment's declining, costs continue to rise because even though enrollment declines, healthcare goes, is yeah. blind you know, to enrollment. Um, you can cut some staffing heads, but the growth rate doesn't change. Even though you may able, be able to slow the impact in real dollars of the growth, that rate change isn't gonna change. The trajectory is the same. So we don't wanna be like others in terms of performance, we don't want to be like everybody else, but to a certain degree, we're a public school system and we are running pretty comparably to most everybody else. Yeah. But we're still getting really good results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I look at some of these 
additions you're talking about, mm -hmm. like reinstate late bus, I can't believe that would be a big issue. No, and it's probably, I mean, it's a very small number. I'm sure yeah. there, I mean, some of this is conversational for Almost the school committee. Almost walk. <laughs> <laughs> the late bus is really about being able to move kids between Manchester and Essex. Yeah. So, so Essex says Manchester has a very <laughs> robust after school program. We're working on equity and making sure everyone has access to the same programming. We're see I, what I've seen since we formally eliminated the late bus is more requests at the elementary for after school busing so we can do some shared programming. Like we have a shared play and we're busing kids back and forth so they can have um, they can have joint practices together. So you know, to your points there, I think it's a fairly small number. Some of this is on here as conversation pieces for our committee. I think in general they are, like like you said, this is small number. We're talking about $10,000, $20,000 out of millions of yeah. um, dollars. So I think that on the Essex side, and also a, a lot of Manchester parents as well, they what they want is... It's not to the you know to debate about the ten thousand twenty thousand. Is they just want transparency. They want to understand what's going on, mm -hmm. and what we, what we are really spending the, the our dollars on in, on the district. And I know that you guys are doing your best, um, and this is tough uh, for Essex especially. And I I think over time, like mm -hmm. you know, once we you know try to communicate and better or like try to show more analysis and the data. And that's why you know Kathy last night mentioned about you know the you know, the assessment, mm -hmm. I think things like that doesn't mean that program cut. It just, it, it will have the material for us to better uh, explain how how mm -hmm. you are, you know, programming the the, um, the different schools, the different grades and whatnot. I think it's that um, trust that I think people um, want to see. And, and I think Essex, especially now, is like, it's really tough. That's why they're using... Uh, that's why t even 10,000 seems like a lot, but mm -hmm. I think in reality it's really just that they, they want better understanding of the numbers. So I want to get some input from the Finance Committee. <laughs> um, we have 3.5% excess levy capacity. You can do some spending using excess levy capacity. You can go out and ask for an override at the ballot box. You've got the turf fields involved. Do you do that via debt exclusion or using reserves? And I think they're looking for feedback from us. Yeah. So I'll speak I, my, can I, Go ahead, can Mike. I, can I, can I, yeah, well, you probably know where I stand, but you know, I mean, <laughs> given the conversation with Andy's point, I mean, I, I think we could just target our reserves a little lower if the school district is going to keep their reserves at their balance and it's just, you know, it, it, it would seem to me otherwise being a doubling up, so. Yeah, but we, we have a policy that we don't use reserves for operating costs, so so we can o we only can use them for capital items, so I don't think. That you, yeah, but that, that's, a, I mean, that's a very gray area because if you look at all the ins and outs of how cash actually gets into the reserve account, it's. It, it's it's very opaque and amorphous, and at the end of the day, I would argue this is capital to capital in the sense that if we're going to lower our reserves to keep their reserves higher, it's I mean I get <clears throat> it's kind of a left pocket right pocket. Well, as long as it's used for capital, <laughs> yeah. I, I I will push back pretty hard if we use reserves for operating. Yeah, With the, <clears> right. <throat> so we we dip in our reserves to that they can fund their capital. Yes, yes, we could do that. Right. But that would be a, a capital exclusion or something, wouldn't it? Uh, you don't have to. Okay. You, you could, instead of doing an exclusion, you could tap into your reserves, just like we use reserve in, in town capital. Right. So but the, you could. The capital comes through as part of the operating budget. The school capital comes through as part of the operating budget. It's not a cat doesn't come through as a capital item. Right. It's all part of one number. It's, it's one all part of one number. Exactly. Are we just trading problems then? Yeah. Are we just trading problems? Yeah. I think well, I mean, think mean the cap. It would be a one-time number. Like for example, it, you would be you would be adding a stabilization line for one year only. That would, if you wanted to fund it through cash, 
not to fund our recurring operating spending, I think is the distinction that you're making, if I'm understanding. Well, so, so the, the 1.2 for the turf, um, we're 60% of that, or yep. whatever. Um, instead of doing a debt exclusion for that, mm -hmm. you could use your reserve. It's really 800, we're talking 60% of 800, right? What Craig just said is what I'm suggesting. So I, that doesn't give me heartburn. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would, I've got plenty of other uses for that. <laughs> Nine hundred thousand or whatever it is, but um, that's that's an option. Could you just do that one more time for me? Because I'm not sure I'm understanding. Explain that one. So they have a let's I guess let's use the full number. You got one point five in capital request. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe I should stick with that. Because it's, <laughs> yeah. I stick with the turf. So the, they've got 1.2 million to to spend on the two turf fields. So our share of that, 60 some on 66 percent. Um, Say 750. Is that? Oh, 750. Yeah, okay. So the 750 thousand comes out of our reserve. We could either tap our reserves and hand that 750 to the school to pay for that, or we could ask the voters to approve a debt exclusion, raise our Tax. level of taxation, which actually it wouldn't because they're dropping it <laughs> further than that, but now I'm getting a little into the weeds. Um, so you could pay it from reserves or you pay it by doing a bond and paying back the bond over 10 years. One time for the reserves. Right, it would be a one time yeah. hit. It's just and keep it's, it simple. On cash to cash, it's cash out of our reserves going for their capital expenditure. I mean, right. it's, yeah. it's clean. Are there efficiencies in doing the two fields together, or are they just both needed? <laughs> They're going to have a short They're both needed, They're both and there will, is assumed efficiencies that will be validated. I mean, we could do them both at once. No, Dean, we don't have the money on our 2023 budget to cover our portion for the Brookfield this right. summer. That's for next. Right. That's the problem. It's not. It's in our 2024 budget. Right. Which means we don't have the money to do it in summer of 2023. So yeah, 2023 is 20 yeah. fiscal 24. Yeah, it's July one. Could be oh, July okay. one okay. and yeah. onward. Yeah. Two. And, and if you used, again, if you targeted reserve money for that, that becomes available April fourth. So in our, our unused levy uh, capacity, three point five percent. Right. Is that is that um, sort of built based on the COVID year where we had a zero percent? Yeah. So okay. we had two and a half from COVID. Yeah. From twenty twenty, and then in twenty twenty one, we only raised the taxes one and a half percent. Right. So we have another percent from that. Right. So, so it's three and a half percent on and top of our two and a half. Well, right. It's a little higher than that. Yeah, well, oh, but, we, we, we're, but we're about 800,000. Yeah, yeah. but, but it, so that the taxes would still go up, but we wouldn't need to go to the ballot box to override two and, prop two and a half. Okay. Um, That's the difference. So, but, but um, you know, effectively what would be happening is in, you know, this coming fiscal year, we'd be sort of saying, you know, we'd be taking back the, the zero percent right. and the one and a yes. half percent that we... Yep. That we uh, went ahead with and and just kind of put it. In. Does that presumably that has to go uh, before town meeting for approval? Oh, it would be part. We would just be part, part of, of the budget. budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And and so that the budget coming in would be higher. Right. And I'd have to explain why. And and if, <laughs> but if but are, you know really the governor on our operating expenses is to some degree whatever Essex approves, isn't it? Yes, there's some yeah. leverage I mean, in there. Essex is, would have to well, operating. You know, whatever operating scenario they're willing to afford yeah, is going to determine, you know, I mean, we could say no uh, on but our own. The, but the question is, how would we want to pay for they, it? they have a bigger nut. Right. Yeah, yeah, how do we want to pay for our piece? Because yeah. it's going to be over two and a half. Oh, I got you. I, yeah. And, you know, just generally, you know, my perspective is, and my feeling is, you know, I, I think, you know, the... The district schools are, you know, have given kids a good quality education, and I'd like to sustain that. 
you know, I'd hate to see that start to um, decline. Um, I don't know whether it's, you know, which column that puts us in effectively. <laughs> I always feel like there's probably going to be some kind of middle ground here that we're talking about. Um, I'd, I'd rather see, you know, sort of any sort of uh, devices of playing with our reserve funds to pay for a portion of the field. I'd rather see that come up as, you know, maybe protect your reserve fund a little bit more. Let, let that be kind of a, a pot for, you know, for another couple few years. Mm -hmm. um, maybe in a few years the, the, um, the apportionment might level out a little bit and it'll be easier to have this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I think to your question about which column, yeah. I think mobile services keeps us strong and keeps yeah. us moving forward. I think what we're trying, the conversation we're trying to have in the reinstate and stabilize is really just to bring out the conversation we've had here tonight. Right. Kind of the if thens, right? Yeah. If you deplete your reserves, you know, or if you split your reserves in half in one year, you need a, you know, obviously very clear. We need yeah. a mechanism for building that back. So that offers an opportunity there and tries to just open up the conversation about putbacks. I mean, we have heard feedback on certain things. So it's more a conversation starter yeah. than it is the end point. So I, like I said, I think we land someplace in the middle there. Yeah. I was like, you know, the, the fields are likely to be the kind of topic which could get some support in the towns, mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as a, an additional separate, you know, expenditure versus, um, you know, I don't know. Replacing pumps and boilers, you know. <laughs> can, can I, can I ask you a question? Hold on just a second, Mike. Okay. Just, okay. Sorry, just on that point, I, yeah. to me that, that leans towards doing a debt inclusion for the fields. I think that's an yeah. easy sell to yeah. people. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a discreet, discreet yeah. pro, uh, uh, project. Yeah. Um, people know what has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, you can... You can make the argument that your your new debt exclusion is less than what you're rolling off, so your net debt exclusion is still declining. Mm -hmm. I think it's an easy sell. Does does the district's portion of the uh, Brook Street field get split between Manchester and Essex, or is that just mm -hmm. Manchester? Um, well, if if it's coming from reserves, it's not being apportioned out because it's really we only apportion out the assessment, which is the Did you want to say something? Yeah, just quick, and this question might have been asked, but I, I guess I'm not clear on the answer. If, if we just stick with the ask that you're presenting now, and we do whatever we need to do, okay, to get you that request, without, without doing an override, without a debt exclusion, we take money out of our reserves, whatever we do, right? But then Essex says no. What like then then what then your overall ask needs to change, correct? Or no? They get nothing. Yeah. It's a failed budget. Yeah. And by statute we then have to go back to school committee to revote a new budget, which could be the same, it could be higher, it could be lower. You know, someone yeah. say it would obviously be lower, but the school committee would have its day to decide that, and mm -hmm. then that would get sent back to it another vote in both towns. And then there's a mechanism if that fails too. Separate town, another town meeting. So another town meeting, yes. Yep, another town meeting in both towns. We need unanimous passage in both towns to have a budget. If right, one town right. votes no, oh. it's a no for everything. Yeah, that's what I thought. So we can kind of do all the things we need to do, and yet it all goes back into the sausage driving, so to speak. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we're good. There was one other caution about the reason why I asked about both fields together is that they're in close proximity to our Lincoln Street well, mm -hmm. and there there may be some correlation with PFAP. Um, yeah. Might be better to do one and see what spike that has on our well, or before we jump in and do both. Um, it's just a, another 
thought before you go jumping in to do both fields with plastic? <laughs> well, I think our, with the not to get too deep with the, the turf project, but I think they're using different materials for fill now. Maybe it's a concom. Yeah, it should be. Yeah. Comcom com doesn't pay attention to people. I would think that the, the latency period. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right, though. Right. It's not a typical no, it's, 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 it's a good point. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I, I thought the deal with Ford said specifically that they, the materials that they're using do not contain PFAS. They did say that. They said that their the bid requirements would require a certification yeah. that's put onto the construction firm or the, the supplier, so to speak. Regarding that, nevertheless, there are questions that get raised. They, they've done uh, some work on that. They presented to the school committee. They also presented the same information to the Conservation Commission and to the Water Task Force in Manchester to say that the data is not supporting that connection, even though there's a lot of concerns. Um, but uh, yes, that's why they're putting in the certification on the suppliers to, to put the legal onus on them. Yeah. So you need anything else from us? <laughs> Clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> Any advice you have going forward? Or anything you don't need to see tonight? Well, I think if it if it goes the way of, you know, funding through debt exclusion for the fields, that changes the numbers a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There were a lot of high-level strikes, Haverhill, Brookline, uh, Melrose. Uh, are we insulate? Is our contract pretty much uh, on a par with what they're now getting, or is there going to be some pressure? We, we see some. We are moving slow through negotiations. Yeah. We are working out the differences and ideas of where things can be, but it, it remains collaborative. Yeah. Um, we're doing a little bit of a hybrid. We, for many years, did um, interspace bargaining, which is, it's great. It, it starts very big picture, and it takes a long time, and it takes a long time to get from the big picture down to the exchange of language. So um, we've moved to, I think I'm, I'd call it a hybrid. It's some traditional conditional bargaining in that we're exchanging paper along the way, so there's details and tracking. Um, but at heart, we're a fairly collaborative group, so we're, I think we're working toward understanding each other's positions and sides and trying to find a number that um, works with the long-term models. I think towns like Hazel and our, our council um, is working many negotiations throughout the state, so it's really helpful to have her perspective there. We are already um, a competitive district with PEG. I think, you know, we've always been in the middle toward the higher end, but certainly not the highest, but, you know, comparable with like communities. I think with at Hazel, Malden, a lot of those strikes have, um, those contracts had double groups within them, so teacher assistants and teachers in the same group. And several of them were hanging up more on the teacher assistant um, living wage issue. Um, or like Hazel needed a big correction to be comparable to the neighboring communities. We're not there. Um, but everyone's watching the news. It's t teachers, you know, kids had a very hard time during COVID. Teachers had a very hard time during COVID. And there's a lot of feeling in, yeah. in our conversation. So a lot of our process is just, you know, every three years it's a good check-in on where people are, where people are feeling and what they feel their needs are. Long way of saying it's taking longer than we had thought it would. We really wanted to have our numbers locked in before budget, but we're progressing in a positive and forward way, and I think it will resolve by April. Not surprises. And that would be for starting the following year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So. We did a one-year contract, so like in Haverhill, they were working without a contract for an extended period of time. They're under contract this year. They had their 2.5% COLA, so um, it shouldn't be disruptive to them at all. So, yeah. Lots going on. Yes. Yeah. But exciting. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> all right. Face masks. That's a good thing.
I know. And everybody's loving the Memorial School. It's all good. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, standing invitation if people haven't seen the inside of the building for a tour. We'd be glad to uh, arrange for that because it is great to see how it came out and yeah. super thankful for the support. Good job. And it's, it's, we had a great um, committee and uh, they helped, and the great project team between the project manager, and construction firm, and uh, the architect. We really, we did well, we, we did well with the people who were helping us. I'm not taking credit for it. I mean, we, we were fortunate. Yeah. We've had situations where you know, sometimes get a project team member, it's difficult or, you know, you get involved in, Debates or whatever that that ended up being a really nice success, and it's going to come in cheaper than we expected, so that's always good too. Yeah. Right. My girls missed it by a hair. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're there. Are they middle school now? What's that? Are they middle school now? Um, one just graduated last year from high school. The other one was. Okay. Well, thank the funniest you. thing about Memorial School is we had our after COVID, we had the great um, kind of the holiday concert where all the grade levels sing in the program and if you remember from your days we used to have police detail fire detail because you couldn't get everybody in that building and there was that auditory that was it cafe gymatorium yeah. <laughs> it, it did it was a beautiful thing there was elbow room space to spare and you really didn't need a stuff. fire detail we didn't need a fire detail <laughs> we didn't need to park people <laughs> all over the town so it was great Amazing. it's really nice to see it it's a good sign I think it has improved traffic flow. At least when I passed oh, good. through there in time, so the we don't have as much queuing. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's all good. A lot's gotten done. Yeah. Thank you for putting up with all our questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Thank you for your support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We really appreciate the support. Yeah. It's an annual tradition. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, running out of bowls. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on with our agenda. Do Greg have any update on grants or any financial matters to bring to our attention? Uh, no, nothing new. But, uh, we're still waiting for a couple of one important grant to pay for the Central Street project. Yeah, okay. Hoping to hear from that in the any day. <laughs> any day. Um, updates from li liaisons. I guess you don't need to give us an update on the school. <laughs> <laughs> um, C CPC, we're going to meet on CPC next week. Yeah. Right? I think so, yeah. The second. Yes. The second. Yeah. Um, before we do the town budget. Have, have you, thank you, have you seen the CPC spreadsheet yet? Yeah, you sent it, you sent it out. I did send it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't I clever? I, saw, I, saw <laughs> I won't I send it again it. then. <laughs> um, I did post the agenda today for that meeting, so it's on the website. Um, next is minutes. We have okay. minutes. December, and I have a couple of changes. Are you on, Gail? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I needed to move chair, switch chairs. Okay. So I'm here. On the December fifteenth minutes. Yes. On page two, the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph down. Okay. Um, you said that Ms. Mellish clarified that the district increase for Manchester is 3.31 and the district is not asking for more than the normal increase. You need to add to that 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 was the, Mr. Fettersfield corrected me and that that was a net, net figure and that the increase in the op, operating budget was higher than normal and can't be offset by the decrease in debt. Got it. And then at the very end, page three, the one that starts with Chief Cleary, it mm -hmm. says deflect spending 400000 it should be defer. Okay. Anybody else have any changes to December 15th? Nope. 
Um, I move to approve the minutes from December 15th. Do I have a I'll second? Second. Dean will second. Take a roll call vote. Andy? Yes. Mike? Uh, Abstain. Okay. Yes. Tom? Yes. Maury? Yes. And Sarah votes yes. I'm going to vote yes. And Dean votes yes. <laughs> minutes from January 5th. I have one comment. On page two, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth bullet from the bottom, facilities department, after, it says new department and new line item hyphen, it should say asked for consolidated historical multiple building department maintenance accounts. It just says consolidated multiple and I said asked for consolidated historical multiple. Got it. And then on page three, the last bullet at the top, it says leaving 400,000 in the fund. It said, it should say leaving 400,000 if ambulance two is repaired. And then the rest explains the discussion of that. Okay. Okay. I read them for once. You did. Good job. <laughs> um, any other changes? I move to approve the minutes of January 5th. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Andy seconds. I'll take a roll call vote. Yes. Andy. Maury. Yes. Dean. Yes. Tom. Yes. Mike. Uh, abstain. Sarah votes yes. Minutes from January 12th. Um, I just had one change, and that was down in the next meeting subject matter. You're missing the February 2nd meeting, which should say CPC in town. When you have the schedule. Well, at that meeting, it was set up for the 9th, but it later changed. But I guess we could. No, no, this says February 9th, public safety and with select board. Oh, right. So, so that, that was a meeting we changed yeah. it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, and then I had something on the very last paragraph. And this was kind of a heated point that I thought was appropriate to have in there. And it says the fire chief indicated he could wait on the ambulance and apply a seven year replacement schedule if we need a new ladder truck. Am I right that he said that? He did say that. He did say that. So I'd like that inserted. Since it's on okay. the tracks. Highlighted. <laughs> Sir, Joe Osborne. <laughs> Any more? What's our priority? This <laughs> Any more changes to the January 12th minutes? I move to approve the minutes from January 12th. Second. Tom, second. Um, take a roll call vote. Yes. Andy. Yes. Maury. Yes. Dean. Yes. Tom. Yes. Mike. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it's Sarah. Yeah. Sarah says yes. You're going to vote for that. Oh, yes. Sarah says yes. Okay. Um, next meeting subject matter is, I just said, is CPC and the town budget. And then on the 9th, you talked about starting earlier. Yes. A joint meeting with select board um, starting at 6 p.m. Um, in order to have sufficient time to kind of come to agreement on the public safety staffing and then to approve the public safety budgets. Some of that was discussed last week. Yes. Yeah, I wasn't here for that. Okay. <clears throat> that was... No, it was discussed on the 12th. Oh, the 12th. Right. So if you look at those minutes, it has PDF attachments with all the presentations. Yes, I have it. Okay, yeah. And this is for the 9th, correct? That's sir? for February 9th. Okay, 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to be remote for that one. Okay. Great. You leave us alone with them. 
I'll be, I'll be present. You have your technical support here. <laughs> um, okay, and then these minutes explain what the rest were. And I think, I think Greg, that you suggested that we should um, add Parks and Rec on February 16th. Yes. When we do, oh, this is incorrect. When we do... Library and Board of Health. And, and Board of Health, yeah. For those three. Yeah. And no Parks and Rec. And then on the 23rd, we'll do the final, we'll vote on the school budget. Mm -hmm. And then we have to have the report done by March 3rd. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get tight. <laughs> so, I must start, I, maybe I should start working on that. And can you put it in SharePoint again? Sure. Good. Because that worked really well. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's good. Nice. Yeah. And you thought it was going to be difficult, but it worked out. It was very easy. <laughs> we'll document that. Um, anything else people want to raise that I might not have anticipated? So just uh, so that the ninth meeting, that's where we'll kind of hash through all the capital requests relative to fire vehicles and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. we'll do the staffing, we'll do the operating budget, and the capital budget. Okay, because I, I thought I read or heard somewhere that the select board had already sort of approved this idea of... Uh, Converting the squad to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, to uh, the second ambulance, basically. Right. Non transport, yeah, right, right. So, the, the so chief we decided for the, not to fix ambulance, too, right, which was a hundred ish thousand yeah. dollars. Well, wow. if you do, if you do the if you do the power lift, yeah. Yeah. Right. 65, but that was the power lift stretch, yeah. yeah. And you can use the one in the, the ambulance that's out, right? That, that was supposed to be replacement when that ambulance was. Being worked on, so we can't take that stretcher out and put it in there. It won't fit in the squad. It won't. No, no, oh, no. Trust the, me, it won't. In the second ambulance that we're fixing. They're not fixing the second ambulance anymore. Right. Nobody's saying if they went that way. Oh. Yeah, so that, that 60,000. Oh, it probably doesn't. You don't need a second yeah, stretcher. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> because you can use the first stretcher. It wasn't going to be a second ambulance because we don't have the personnel to run two ambulances, but it was going to be. <laughs> A I backup think. ambulance yeah. for when the first ambulance needs repairs. Yeah. So I think they, they look at it operationally as a second ambulance. They don't look at it as the first ambulance is in the shop and not available. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what they need. So at our fall meeting, we um, voted for to allocate funds for an ambulance. Mechanically, what happens to that now? I think we have to. So you, you, you should, if you don't use it, you should vote to put it back into the fire apparatus okay. fund. Perfect. Great. But we'll need a warrant article. So that would happen in, in April. Okay, yeah. good. Or if, if there's other capital that you're purchasing, then you, it could be part of that vote. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have it move back into the fire. Yeah. Right. No. I, if, fund if, if, if take it out again for something else. If, if I was. If you're voting in capital for some new fire equipment, yeah. you could in one vote just move it. But we, we can depends yeah, on what I, depends I, on what we're doing. Gets messy. So, yeah. so that gets. So how does that sh um, how does that get reconciled with the voters and the tax bills? Does that become an offset? No, it came out of the. It wasn't. So it came out of a fund. It wasn't. A, oh right, it was right, already of course. In the fund. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah of and, course. And the uh, so the the notion of the the assessment of the current ladder truck that determines that there's we need a new one. Um, given the cost of that thing, you know, it's. Uh, he was told to have that information by February 9th. Well. Hopefully in advance. But I, I thought the solution was Minuteman and get some stickers with an R on them. And just keep reusing those. <laughs> Sorry. A black R, not a red R. 
No, I, I guess I, but my, my point is, is just that, you know, I don't know if this comes from like the mechanic, you know, that happened to be working on the thing, like whose professional perspective is it that's saying that this ladder truck needs to be replaced? So the, is, the issue is the emissions. I, I get it, but um, that's a, that's a and, motor. Right, and, and, and so, so they exhaust, went, yeah. yeah, so they've been working with the motor manufacturer. Okay, yeah, Detroit Diesel, yeah. I recall, yeah. yeah. Any progress there? No. I know they were saying no progress before. But. It, they they so we did what they recommended, oh. and what they recommended did not. Right. So they were going back to them again. Yeah. And uh, I don't think they they have any new advice besides sorry it's not going to pass your Massachusetts standards. Yeah. Okay, but I guess my what the where I'm where I'm going is um, similar conversation that we had with the stamp with the the second ambulance. Sure. So you could know? you put a new motor? In it? For less than one point two million. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I would guess a lot less. Yeah. And I, you know, and I know there's other aspects to the ladder truck, including the ladder, and you know, and some other hydraulics and all that kind of stuff. But it's just, I, I feel like we continually, you know, operate like a mushroom in a dark space when it comes to you know how we proceed on making decisions for this kind of stuff. We have to have it. We have to have it. Oh, no, I guess we don't need it. Yeah, exactly. A five-year plan, need a long, long, seven-year plan. The squad car plan. is the it's solution just... of the future. <clears throat> oh, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, it, it, my, my metaphor is dog squirrel, right? <laughs> <laughs> squirrel. Yeah, exactly. Distraction. Anyway, it's... it's you know, it's sort of year over year frustration. No, I, and understand. So I, I, I understand. That's why I, I'm sorry I bent a little bit, but nope. no, it's, and it's like we should have a thinking period of 18 months on these decisions because yeah. that's about the time cycle it takes to change, at least over the last five. Yeah. So if we average out over 18 months, we'll probably actually hit something that's Makes even more. Choices. <laughs> Wasn't there some questions whether we even needed a ladder truck at some point? Well, that's that's a different operational perspective, and that's and that and there's, that also then kind of goes to the conversation of you know each chief's individual philosophy about what their their fire apparatus needs to be because the last chief had to, you know bought the squad car and this or the squad truck the little roads and the little driveways right, right and this and this fire chief believes that there's no place for that squad truck in our doesn't have enough water. Does Essex, have a, does Essex have a ladder truck as well? Brand new one, I heard. Right. Well, that's what Essex I'm has hearing. a ladder, yes. The, that's yeah. what my thinking was. It's, can we look at who our mutual aid partners is and see what, among the group, what's the need? You know, as far as... Good question. One guy has the great ladder truck, one guy has a great pumper truck, another guy has a great... You know, yeah, you know, so what the mutual aid... Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, we can get into this next time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but so our, what we provide in mutual aid is, is the evidence because we have a paramedic crew, yeah. and that's a valuable resource, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what gets used in our neighboring communities. So we yeah. go out to other communities on mutual aid with that with that ambulance, mm -hmm. a fair amount. But that's not quite the same because it's reimbursed, right? Not necessarily. I mean, there's no the fire. No, you look at the numbers yeah. and. What we take it's, in in revenue does not have the cost. Right. They use the word revenue in a very positive light. It's basically cost deflection. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like 20%, maybe. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could be looking at it wrong, Greg can correct me, but even if we do get revenue back, say, on an ambulance mutual aid call, I would believe that the fire department in that town or city we're going to, that's not how they're looking at it, right? They're just looking at it like, Hey, we made a mutual aid call. These guys from the town next door showed up. That's a cool thing, right? Like, they don't, they don't really care whether or not there's some insurance company that you know gets bills paid. Hey, these from Manchester ambulance come to them to help them. And that's so cool. that's a good thing. So then, obviously, hopefully in reverse, you know, they look great mutual, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just making that note. That's something we provide, and then it would be okay for us to rely on someone else for a ladder truck, for example. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. Given that our ambulance calls are like six or eight times our fire <laughs> calls. Correct. 
I now know when I see the ambulance and the engine that it's a oh, response yeah. to, a, to, a, it. to a to a to a car. Two vehicles are going situation. to everything now. Yeah. 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 Um, you can buy a I, pickup and send it along for less. Than do I? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Sorry. So moved. <laughs> I have a second. Second. Uh, take a roll call vote to adjourn. Andy. Yes. Maury. Yes. Dean. Yes. Tom. Yes. Mike. Yes. And Sarah votes yes. Thank you a lot. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.